my mom and him always worried about like, well, if you have pink hair and you end up in a weird situation, which by the way, it did many times. You were with me in Kentucky when we ran for our lives because I had orange hair and a bunch of guys wanted to kill us. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000 punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. David A. Patino is an NJ legend, to me, anyway. He played in such bands as the Jerkoffs, my old band Lanemeyer, and would date the fair when they get together at the Stanhope House every once in a while to play shows. He also recorded bands back in the day, was a constant show goer. And uh, if you ever saw him at a party, most likely he was naked at some point because that was his thing. I've known Dave since I was 18, which we talk about in the interview. And uh, he's one of my all-time most favorite people in the world because he's just very genuine. He's very passionate. He's very fucking talented. And if you have a chance to hire him to do photography, you should. He's located in Jersey. So you should do that as well. So I reached out to him and I was like, dude, you're going to talk to me uh, about things that are punk rock related. And he was like, fuck yeah, obviously I'm not doing anything because I'm uh, very lazy. And this is what we talked about. The band, The Police, the NJ Hotspot Obsessions, fucking with our hair color when we were kids, going to Berklee School of Music, creating a recording studio in his basement, working at the Hot Topic in the Rockaway Mall, how clicky the scene actually was. How the Jerkoffs really broke up. Jay, you should pay attention to this one. Recording the band Houseboy. The tour with Lane Meyer and Lounge when we got chased by Rednecks in Kentucky. Writing my song Energy for Lane Meyer. The super annoying guy who wanted to sign Lane Meyer. Fucking, oh man. Trying out for Ari from Lifetime's band Zero Zero and a ton more. Before we begin, this week's episode is sponsored by DriveAD.com, which is my animation company. And uh, so if you want to hire me to do logos, I'm doing a deal right now where it's $100 to animate your logo. If not, then you can also hire me for hourly projects. If you have graphics, you want to make a move, make them Instagram videos, I can do that. Or if you want a really big project and want an explainer video that explains what your company does in 60 seconds or less, then you can hire me to do that. And if you don't want to do that, then um, maybe you want to donate to the podcast. So if you want to do that, you can sign up to be a patron where you can pay a dollar a month for however long as, as long as you want. And if you want to just do a one-time donation, you can go to thiswasthescene.com and click on the purple button on the top that says donate. And you could donate whatever you like. This would be really helpful since uh, I uh, have rent due on Tuesday. And uh, this would really help pay for that because uh, I'm not really sure how I'm going to do that right now. And uh, I'm not even kidding. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. Anyone listening, I have known Dave since I was like fucking 18, 17, 18, which was 18. over 20 years ago. Or 20 years ago. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Wow. Yeah. And You're getting old. You fuck you. You're older than me, bitch. You're like, <laughs> I think you're a year older than me. But me and, so. <laughs> me and Dave grew up in Jersey, and we didn't know each other until we met each other through the scene. And I thought Dave would be an awesome interview. One, because he's just fucking hilarious and really does has no feet. You know what's the word? Not fear. Um, no filter. I guess. Mm. And we actually talked about Dave and the Jay Jerkoff interview, which I think was like 25. Actually, I've talked about Dave in a lot of interviews. So anyone listening, if you want to go through, if, if you ever hear me mentioning Dave or Patino, this is yeah, it's a one liner. This is the guy. So I would like to congratulate you on, I thought you were going to um, hit rock bottom much later and call me and be like, <laughs> Oh my God, I have nobody else, but it only took like two and a half seasons. So sorry about that. Well, you're going to, you're probably going <laughs> to, once you see the, the the couple interviews that happened before you, you're going to be like, dude, why the fuck are you putting me on after these guys? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people on Instagram or online have wanted to talk more about Jersey or wanted me to talk more about Jersey. Cause I did break away from there and talk with the bands that I thought were an influence on the scene. And I like that approach, but um, there are a couple interviews. There are about two before Dave that are directly from people in New Jersey and talk about that. But Dave was very embedded in the scene. A, I want to talk to him because he's my friend and I don't, you know, I haven't talked to him well. So you get to listen to that. But second is he played in bands. He recorded bands. He's, what else have you done? I mean, you didn't do any photography for bands. You've done some band no. videos. Uh, kind of after the fact. Uh, yeah, much later in life, but yeah. Yeah. 
and Dave also went to a lot of shows. And uh, so I thought he'd have a lot to say, especially about Jersey in general, or just, I don't know, some funny stories, because that's just Dave has that. So you, you have re- to entertain us, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I remember a few things. I um, It's funny. I don't consider myself being a, a big part of the scene, like you just said, like a, like a, a, a fixture in the community, if you will. I always consider myself like I was kind of riding on the outside. I think, and, yeah, and that and that enabled me to escape unharmed. <laughs> well, I mean, you were a kind of a behind the scenes guy because as a drummer in a band, you are like you're there, but you're also in, in kind of in the back. Like drummers like to be, I guess, hidden. Yeah, right. But you you were also very animated. Where you were like like the guitar or the bass player of the band. Like I thought you were more of someone to watch when the jerk offs played, other than. Um, Christ, who was their bass player again? Doug. Doug. Yeah, I thought you stood out more than Doug did. <laughs> Doug. Yeah, well, there you go. Doug was quiet. <laughs> yeah, he was a super quiet and, guy. It was tough because Jay was such a personality. Yeah. I mean, he Jay was everything as far I, as I was concerned. You know, I mean, Jay was like the the brainchild behind it all. He would, you know. But you were like a, a great compliment to it because you just went you. along with it. Yeah, but you are, you have a very... So I don't want to say sarcastic. You just have a very Patino esque. Mm. It's sarcasm. It's called sarcasm. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely sarcasm. <laughs> this will probably uh, be one of the most sarcastic shows. It'll be like this one, the Alan Rappaport, and then Jay Jerkoff. Like this will be like you'll be the third most sarcastic interview. Yeah, probably. I have a lot of clients now and friends that that just look at me and go like, I I can't tell if you're fucking with me or not. <laughs> and I love to keep it that way. You know. What was the it makes makes life more interesting. So Dave does photography now. Uh, he's been doing this for years as a full-time gig. Works for himself. Dave David Patino Photography. If you guys are looking that up. And yeah. I went on a shoot with him a couple of years ago. This might be yes. 2010. Actually, that's like no 2011. So maybe like seven years ago. Wow. That was my first big job. Was it really? That was. I remember saying to the, the wedding people, dresses. Yeah, that was a whole catalog. Oh, that's right. It was the catalog. I remember saying to people like, "This is the biggest job I've ever had." And, uh, and it was at that time and I needed you. Well, the funniest thing is that, (laughs) so Dave's interview or he's doing, uh, he's shooting with a, with a camera, uh, these four, what were they like 20, 21, 18, how old were they? They were maybe 18, 19 tops. So these young girls are models and these wedding dresses and he's doing these different photo shoots around this mansion that's in Chester. Somewhere in New Jersey. And, uh, 90 acres in Natterar. Yeah, that's it. And he's like, fucking, I think at one point she said something. You were like, yeah, we'll tell this little whore <laughs> to like, I might have. move to I the thought. left. But that's just Dave's personality. He'll just talk like that. And people are like, oh, are you fucking with us? And he's like, no, it's just get away with stuff. My wife always says to me, she's like, how, I, I love how you're able to just say things to your clients and you get away with it. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. It, you know. Because honestly, like, they're just words to me. Like, you know if I love you or I hate you, right? And so if I call you a little bitch or the love of my life, it it really could mean the same thing. <laughs> well, I think yeah. that, well, there's no there's like no venom behind the words. Like you're not no you, you're no, never no, no. mad at someone. And we will talk though about later on of the lane days get mad. where yeah yeah yeah, yeah I we'll, can talk about anger. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I think one of the things where this is you know. A, you're a great person to talk to is that besides thinking you were not a part of the scene, you engulfed it though. Like you were such a fan of music. Mm-hmm. So when, when you would sure. sh- introduce me to bands, I mean, you had, you would see things in songs that I never saw. Like you would explain a band to me. Like I think Texas was, Texas is the reason the first time I heard them was because of you. And I think you told me about a show that you went to where you saw them and sense field and somebody else and he said, like, the singer was started to cry and the crowd started crying. Do you remember this? Was that you? No. <laughs> I, I swear it was you. It was I've like seen, at Wetlands. I've seen Sensefield. Uh, I've seen Sensefield. I know that. You and, never saw Texas and that The Reason? Was, I, saw, I saw maybe, like, two songs of Texas The Reason once. Yeah, it was at Wetlands, and right? I believe it was at Wetlands. I think you're right. No. Um, it wasn't with Sensefield, though. I'm trying to remember who it was. was it but it was... Go ahead though. Tell, finish your story because you're totally right. No, but you just when you would when Dave explains a band to you, he goes layers below where I even think about it, 
And so when he introduced me to certain bands, like, and sometimes I'd hear it and I'm like, I still don't hear it the way you hear it. <laughs> but yeah. You're just like really <laughs> passionate about it. But, um, so yeah, so really kind of rein this in. I want to go down the direction of talking about just how you got involved in the scene, how you started playing in bands, what bands you played with, how you recorded them and shit like that and go along that timeline. But to start it off, like all of these interviews up into all 46 of these interviews, uh, how, what bands got you into music personally? So if I go way back in time, yes, uh, to so I started playing drums at like in the third grade, I think. Really? And I came from a very musical family. Um, I had I had oh, there was always guitars and pianos and stuff like that in the house, and so my parents tried to get me to play piano, and I took uh, like four or five lessons, and the teacher came back and was like, "This this isn't going to work out. Like he's just not going to like he won't read the music." So like basically, what I would do is I would like I would memorize the song right yeah and then i would just like play it back to her but i didn't know what i was looking at on the paper i just remembered it in my head and i would play it back so because i didn't want to learn to read music it just wasn't for me and so she kind of politely said like hey why don't you just let this kid play drums because i think he'll be better fit for that and so <laughs> <laughs> so a drum set showed up and i started playing drums and and from there it just kind of took and i couldn't stop watching mtv and like any concert films i could get my footage on like the police to me at that time we're talking like mid 80s here and i didn't really know the police my uncle introduced me to them just after they broke up and like that to me was the epitome of music like you first of all there's no better drummer in the world you know and then there's sting who can have sex for like eight hours <laughs> and then there's andy Summers. he's still yeah. having sex right now from the time we found out yeah. about it and like he's yeah, been he's, he's like, been on the same sex He's totally tantrying his wife right now. <laughs> Antrochine, I think is what they're For called. 20 years straight. Yeah. And then there was Andy Summers, who like I never thought was a great guitar player. I just thought he made the coolest sounds come out of guitars. Yeah. And later on in life, I realized he was great. But but that, to me, was it. And like all I wanted to do was just play drums like Stuart Copeland and, and you know, like tour the world. Like they had this video. It was out called The Police Around the World. And I shredded the tape. I watched it so much. What was the like, first video you saw the police stuff? Cause I remember MTV and wrapped around your finger was big with mm -hmm. the candles and all that all around. I remember as a young kid, that was all like that moody shit really brought yeah. me in. Like, do you remember the yeah, first one you saw? I'm trying to remember video wise. I don't remember. I remember the first police cassette tape I got was, um, Zinjeta Mandetta and which was heavily reggae influenced that entire album. And, um, yeah, I don't, but I'm trying to think video wise. I don't really remember. Yeah, I don't know, but I used to go. I used to go to like the the easy video down the street and go to the music section, and I would watch like you know the the old Zeppelin concert films and like the Police videos and the U, like the U two Rattle and Hum thing. I ate through that tape too. I like I just couldn't stop watching live music. I was so into it. I remember my dad. I remember I I was at Milton Video in Jefferson when I was like seven or eight and you you 2s rattle and hum came out and it was on the shelf and i picked it up and i wanted to watch it my dad was like no you're too young you can't watch that and to this day i still don't know why he <laughs> didn't fucking let me see it and i just thought then i saw it, it was like this r-rated movie like what, oh what, why can't i see it i want to see it now even to like today yeah. i still i've never seen it and I, I yeah and i want to see it just to the fact of like what the fuck was he talking about Nothing. There's not even like boobies in it or anything. <laughs> no nothing. boobies. Yeah, man. Like, no, it's not even like a Motley Crue concert film. It's just, it's you too. You Maybe know, it's he just like fucking hated you too. He's like, oh, don't listen to this shit. Honestly, I could see that. Your dad hated a lot of immigrants, <laughs> especially the Irish ones. It's <laughs> true. He was very against the Irish. Being a doyle, yeah. he was like, oh, uh, I hate our people. He was so over the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay. So, you, uh, you, okay, go on. Go on with your. Because yeah. So it was, um, it, to me, it was the police. It was all that. And then I got to high school and, um, and then I was into a lot of stuff like, cause you know, you start meeting other kids and you start talking to other people. And, and I went to like a, a, a small Catholic regional high school. So I met people that I had never met before all of a sudden and had no connection with. And so they had music taste. And, um, I ended up, my first band, uh, was my freshman year and it was a band called absolute zero. Okay. And, yeah, and it was this beautifully horrific blend of like metal and funk and like just any, like basically like you know if the bass player like the bass player was into like like Kiss and so he would write these like Kiss riffs and the guitar player was into like like Megadeth and like Rage Against the Machine and I was into like all this different stuff and the singer couldn't really sing but he was had spunk and so it sounded you know like so it was just this weird mix of stuff. You know, we ended up like covering like 
Rage Against the Machine in our shows. And, and uh, you know, it was like whatever. Like whatever, we just all loved playing music, so it kind of just worked. Where's this, like, when, I, when you said shows, though, was that at the high school, like coffee houses and things like that? Um, no, we'd end up, so there was, uh, anybody who's from Jersey will probably remember Obsessions, which oh, was yeah. in Randolph, which was, you know. Um, the hottest was, like, picket in town. Dude, that was home base, man. I mean, like, we played there, like, I think four times the summer between my freshman and sophomore year. And I, I was the coolest fucking kid because of that. Like, that's how I felt. I felt so... I felt like, yeah, we sold 20 tickets tonight and we're going to go on fourth because that's the hot slot and people are going to stage dive and, you know, I'm going to go home by myself. And like, I'm it's, so much ass. No, there was no ass to be had. I was <laughs> shy and I stood behind the drum kit. But yeah, that's how I felt. I just felt like, yeah, we made it. We played obsessions, <laughs> you know, and then, um. And then, yeah, that band, the guitar player graduated and he went on. But it was during that first year that I also found punk, which I had never really heard of before. Yeah. How'd you find Like, how did that happen? Um, I, so the first CD I ever bought, uh, first CD ever, first punk rock CD too, was um, Generator. Or, uh, yeah, Generator. By how, how did you know to buy that though? Had a cool cover and it had been playing in the store. Okay. And then I got it home and I played it and it this just the sound of those drums, they were just so tight and so punchy and like, you know, he just riffs on these lyrics like they're going out of style. And yeah. so I just like I just like all music I did at that time, I just swallowed it whole. And then my I remember my aunt was uh, at the time she lived in California. She was married to this uh, guitar player who taught and he was teaching Greg Graffin's kid to play guitar at the time. What? Yeah. And so like in the liner notes, it says like thank you to ed finn which and i was like that's my fucking uncle like wow. I was so, yeah i was so like just like oh my god this you know like there was my connection and then i just i don't know i just ate it up and from there um like bad religion was just you know they were the shit and then we just kept going from there and all my friends got into punk rock and then it was you know the whole west coast speed thing and um yeah i mean that came later on in high school but but bad religion was like my anthem I think I, I'm actually quoted in my yearbook. That's like my high school senior year quote is bad religion. Like that's how into it I was. Did you start like dr like dressing? Because you've always changed your style. Even now it being like, you know what, 52? <laughs> uh, I'll be 60 next week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dave to this day will still just, Dave's a very artsy guy, I think. Not, not like overly annoyingly artsy where you see those people and you're like fucking relax but dave will just <laughs> dave will subtly su su subtly subtly um subtly change something it's usually facial hair these days or haircut um yeah but when i met you you're always changing your hair color or you, know, you, wear, always. you always wear like the same outfits but when did you kind of start going off into this freedom of i feel like does, was the punk rock thing that kind of set you off going in that way or were you always like that yeah, it was also the rebellion of high school. Like I said, I was in this small, tiny Catholic high school. There was only like 115 kids in my class, something like that. Our school had like where was the school? I though? went to Mars Catholic in Denville. Okay, it's I think so, people in Jersey would be like, oh fuck, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so you know, to me, it was kind of just like, how do we push back against the dress code? You know, because there was a lot of like, you had to wear tie and you had to wear uh. whatever this and that. And so, um, for me, it, like you couldn't have long hair in high school. They would give you a demerit or detention or whatever the hell it was and so i started just keeping my hair short but cutting it really weird like so at the time everybody was, had the the you know the sides of their head shaved and they had the little top was all long right that was like the late 90s haircut yeah and so i went and ben franklin to myself i shaved the top of my head and left the sides <laughs> just for the hell of it <laughs> you know um it, it's so funny that you were rebelling because your dad was a very like non non stuffy dude though I thought every time I met him I mean, he would always be like I, I didn't th he never was one of those dads like you know like your friends dads you were like sometimes scared of them because they wouldn't fucking say anything and you were like oh hello Mister blah 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 but your dad I mean I also met you when I was eighteen which is not too far off from when you were a sophomore but he just always seemed like he just kind of gave you free reign I broke him oh okay I, br I broke him he saw you coming as Ben Franklin he's like yeah. I I'm just done. I rode him so hard. He was so broken by the time I, I was done with high school. Cause he was, I remember like being a little kid and we'd be at the Rockaway mall and like, you know, a group of punks would walk by and, and he would say to me, if you, 
if I ever sit across from the dinner table from someone who looks like that, I'll just, you know, he would get so angry. And sure enough, five years later, there I was with like a weird reverse mohawk and I had pierced my own ears. And I mean, like he was basically like, you're not allowed in my house to pierce your ears. <laughs> and thank God for my stepmother who talked him into letting me in the house because he was like, absolutely not. And then from there, I just kept, I just kept going. Like, you know, I was like, they'll get used to it. Like, they're not going to yeah. throw me out because I get pierced or tattooed or because I cut my hair weird, especially hair, like hair fucking grows back. dude. Yeah. You know, that's. And that's why I was like about it. I get very bored with myself. And so that's how I change things up. I remember I came home with pink hair one time. My friend Martha helped me dye it. I went to Hot Topic at Rockway Mall. Hell yeah. Got the kit. I went to her house in West Milford. She dyed it bleach blonde first. And my head was like on fuck, fucking fire. Oh, yeah. Because the bleach just like strips out all color. And then she dyed oh, it. Oh, yeah. I walk in with a hat on. My mom was like, and I'm, I've been living in the town the condos in berkshire ridge condos in jefferson uh-huh. up berkshire valley and i walk in my mom's just like why do you have it what is that and i take it off she like didn't talk to me for a week yeah. and i remember when i got my first tattoo my dad saw it and he told my sister he's like I, it felt like he got hit by a car or something i was yeah. like you, i was like wow way to be <laughs> what the fuck it's like so so <laughs> weird about shit. right but I, yeah, my dad was always laid back in personality. He was very buttoned up though. And so like even music, I mean, we had a lot of conversations. He was big into music. He plays guitars. There's always a slew of acoustic guitars around the house. And like, but he plays the same six sad songs to this day <laughs> that date from the late fifties to early sixties. And they're beautiful, but like, it's like, you know, like we had these fights where he was like, you know, you can't, I was like, dad, you have to listen to this. Like, it's more than just like, I know he says motherfucker, but he's not talking about fucking your mom. You know, like and my dad would be like, well, what else is a motherfucker other than fucking your mom? Like, you know, we'd have these conversations. And like, so I think he was kind of open to it, but he was always, you know, trying to push me and try to keep me, you know, a little bit. He was worried about, I think, about how the rest of the world was going to view me. I think my mom and him always worried about like, well, if you have pink hair and you end up in a weird situation, which, by the way, it did many times. You were with me in Kentucky when we ran for our lives because I had orange hair. And a bunch of guys wanted to kill us. Wait, I you know, like, wait, I do not. You don't remember, remember that? I did not remember that. Yeah. Do, do we uh, want to wait to tell that story when we talk? Yeah, about we'll that? Wait to okay. Like, All right, I'll make a note of that. Me, they were always trying to keep me like, hey, just you know, relax, man. Like, yeah, you know, we're worried about how everybody else is going to view you, and like, we know that you're okay, but the rest of the world might. They're going to judge the book by its cover, and I was always like, fuck that. I'll figure out a different way. I, it's kind of weird that we we all. I think a lot of people listening to this can really relate to that because I think we. All for some reason, no, I no idea how we thought of it. We just felt that they were wrong, right? Yeah. Like we just knew that things were going to work out, and we were fine. We we're like, or we just saw it as it's just, it's just hair, it's just skin, it's just clothing, it's, yeah. it's, it's just, it's not like everything. No, and the big thing is that we were, you know, we we were around fifty people that were doing the same thing. Well, we didn't know that until we showed up at these shows. Sure. Right. So we saw it on videos or MTV or in the liner notes and then it was how do we get around them and then we kind of just stumbled across that at these legion hall shows these like local yeah. shows so like actually it's so just, I, that's, yeah go on I, so be, uh, let's back up because we started talking about it a million years ago but yeah. so yeah i had this first band we played at this club called obsessions i didn't go to a legion hall show until um like maybe two or three years later because like my first band and my second band which was like a hard rock metal band like those guys had long hair, like they were real metal. Yeah. And it, like we played at clubs. Like, like my dad would like come with me and cause I was only like 14 at the time. And he'd be like, like I wasn't allowed in the club and he'd be like, no, it's cool. He's with me. He's playing drums in the first band. And everybody else in the band was like 18. So like I played like the cricket club and like all the Jersey staples in the, you know, mid Did you play pipeline? Did you do the pipeline? Um, I did pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, fear, fearful the whole time I was there. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I didn't know any better at that time. And you know, I was like literally like 14, 15 years old playing in clubs, which was fun. And then, you know, I played in a few. It's not like I was out every weekend, obviously. Like I did a couple of shows, you know, and um, and then and then senior year I got into or junior year or whatever. I got into this like punk band. It was a punk band and we played a Legion show and I had never seen anything like it. Uh, actually, Oblivion played. Um, I believe it was Oblivion from Chicago. Yeah. Wait, what show was this? Uh, I have no idea. It was in Sussex County. Uh, we're talking like 1995, probably. Okay. 90, 
four ninety five and uh, yeah ninety five probably I think it was Oblivion. Was anyway, it at they, a Legion Hall though, or was that that club that was in Sussex, like on in the? It's like where Flayed used to play all the time. Okay. It was definitely do it yourself thing. Okay. I was I just remember being blown away. I was like, wow, this is like so everybody just showed up here, <laughs> like everybody knew to come here tonight. Um, you know, there was no like webs or well, I guess there wasn't websites, but you know, there was no like. It was just somebody who put a show together. And I remember being like, wow. And I saw Oblivion and I'd never seen a guy play drums that fast before <laughs> <laughs> ever. I'd heard it, you know, I'd seen, I'd heard the no effects albums, but I'd never seen it in real life. Yeah. I was like, what? Um, yeah. And that was, that's when I was like, oh, cool. There's this. And then that's when I was introduced to like the Legion halls and like the do it yourself show thing. Did you ever see, think of when I just thought of this now, when I would always go to a show, I'd always be afraid of the, if I, the band got on stage and I was like afraid of them, I knew it was going to be good. Like the first time I saw at the drive-in was at, uh, Coney Allen high mm. and they got on stage and, and again, they didn't have any pictures of themselves in this, in the liner. Notes, so I didn't know who was who. And I'm waiting to oh, see fun. like, yeah, I was like, what? I always loved that too, where you didn't know what the band looked like and you saw them live and you're like, that's oh, what yeah. they look like. That's crazy. And so they got up on stage and I was like shaking. I'm like, I don't know how this is going to I'm like, why am I nervous right now? This is crazy. I mean, it was maybe I was just excited. But I remember, I think when I started going to Legion Hall shows, I was that same way with the crowd. Mm. Like all the kids that were around me, I was just very impressed. I'm like, wait, how did you know about this? Wait, you know about this for longer than I have. Like, that's so yeah. cool. Like, <laughs> how did you figure this out? You're so fucking cool. And then, and then after a while, when you became part of the crowd, you just started to blend in. But I felt like I was an outcast of that crowd, even though I was, you know, dressed wise and men- sure. men- mentality wise, a part of that crowd. But I was, you know, so when you see you go to that first show, it's like, you see these kids there, you're like, how did you know about this? This is so fucking awesome. You're, yeah. you're cool. Tell me the ways. Like I just, I yeah, I, that's how I felt. And actually, I had a, I had a great in. I'll, 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 uh, I'll throw credit. So that the the punk band I was in was called No Grapes, and it was called No Grapes because the guitar player had uh, found a bunch of stickers that said No Grapes, and so we were like, well, we have free stickers, <laughs> so let's just call the band this. And it turns out it was this whole like migrant farmer boycott Cesar Chavez thing from the eighties and he had found all these stickers. They were huge bumper stickers. They were like six inches tall and they said no grapes. And so we were like, that's awesome. Let's just call the band no grapes. But like, so this is Jared, I'm talking about Jeremy Alasoskis who, if anybody knows him, you'll know that to this day he is, I mean, he is like just, he is who he is. He's true to his music. He's true to his craft. He's true to his guitar playing. He's true to his writing and his DJing and everything he does. And I only ever see him on Facebook now. I probably haven't seen him in 20 something years, but he helped shape this idea in my head of just be whatever the fuck you want. Mm. You know, like, cause he would hang out with the Wiccans and he would hang out with the goths and he would hang out with the punks. And like, you know, he kind of showed me around and introduced me to like, you know, the sadder side of things. And like, it's okay to listen to the Smiths. You don't have to hide. It. Cause I was always like, listen to the Smiths, but I'm not going to tell anybody. And he'd be like, no way. That's awesome. And yeah. And like, we would just drive around in his truck and he would just play me like, weird punk rock from all over the world or what it seems like all over the world. And I was like, you're so wise, Jeremy, like <laughs> let's smoke more cigarettes now. <laughs> how old are you? you st- song. Wait, how old are you? You started smoking. Cause you're, are you still smoking now? Or did you quit? I quit. I smoked, uh, I quit two, almost three years ago now. Okay. Um, Dave was yeah, a was huge a smoker. Me. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it. So good. Dave had this way uh, of smoking a cigarette. I just want to say this. Dave had a very special way of smoking a cigarette. I don't know if you ever caught this. Like Dave would with do my it, butthole? He would do it. He would put his put it in his ass. He would double tap when he would ash. He'd double tap and he'd like rotate the cigarette in the ashtray and tap it again and then and then he'd smoke it. Oh, uh, you're making me want a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> I was like the one of the things I first realized. I was like, this guy's very like in- in- intricate with the detail. Even his cigarettes, he's doing this like very like planned out. I like to keep that point on him. I like that. that <laughs> yeah. Taper point. He's also slightly OC, fucking OCD. <laughs> ah, horrible. Years on medication. So like, what? So, so when you played after the, you played that show, how long were you guys a band until you? Like, um, basically, high school. I had a band every year because somebody would graduate and go on, and then we'd be like, well that band's over. Like, (laughs) so, uh, yeah, I left high school and I, um, I was actually supposed to go, uh, to college in Boston. Uh, I got into Berkeley college of music. Oh, wow. And, um, 
it was the only school I applied to. And Damn. I was like, if I get in, I'm going. And if I don't get in, fuck it. And so I got in and I got a little help to go there. And But they were like, you can come, but you have to start in June in the summer session because you don't know how to read music. And that's very important here. And so I was like, cool, I'll just, whatever, I'll go early. And so I showed up in June and I lasted like five days. And I promptly left. I think I do returned. remember this story because you yeah. came back and that's when you gutted the, your dad's basement and made it into the studio, right? Uh, basically, it was about the, yeah, so it was like a year later. Okay. I came back from Boston. I moved in with him. And then, yeah, and then it was probably about a year later we got into that house. And that's when I had the, gutted like, that full, basement. <laughs> full fucking rain of the downstairs yeah. because that's yeah. how we Which met. was awesome. Like yeah. the fact that they let me do that was just amazing, but – so when you um, so you came back from um from school, what happened then? Uh, well, first of all, I was lost and I was broken. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was mentally not in a good place, and and I just um yeah, I came back to the friends I knew and the couple of things I knew, and I, to this day, I still don't know how I ended up at the Legion Hall in Mount Arlington. But that's somehow I ended. I can't remember. Somehow I ended up there, and that's where I met all of you guys. Probably Granite. Uh, I think it was Granite, right? It might have been. I, I mean, I worked at Hot Topic, so I think that was my end to it. Wait, you, um, you were, you were you working there with Sean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sean was my boss. I did not remember that. Yep, I was Hot Topic kid. Wow. Um, okay. You, well, Granite, yeah. Sean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that Conti. kid, Kevin, the hardcore kid, and. But at that time, I was really into like hardcore. I was into like yeah. I was gonna say that you were huge in hardcore, like Inside Ooh. Out and all that shit. Oh my god, man! I just love to scream, and so <laughs> that was the way to just get it all out. Like, I mean, that's how you and I actually kind of connected, is because you were into a lot of the, like, I, you were into Deftones, and I was into Deftones. I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah, and that like like Deftones to me were like there was no better band at that time. Yeah, they were so fucking like, good. Oh, so good. God. To this day, those those first couple albums, I just like. How can you sing that sweet and pretty and then scream? Yeah. Like that, that to me is like any band to this day, like that screamo shit where somebody's like, nah, and then they're like, oh, I'm going to eat your face. Like, I love that. <laughs> yeah, like, I just love that. They're like, just like really pretty. And just like, rrr, rrr, rrr. like uh. yeah. so, sometimes they can't pull it off though. Sometimes they're doing it. You're like, uh, like, yeah, uh, it's gotta Devil be Wars well. Prada. When I hear that shit, I'm like, eh, nah. uh, no, not good. But, but if you can scream a love song, you're okay in my book. If you do, if you if the the, the style of the scream is where it's at, it has to be a very distinct yeah. style of yeah. the way you sound. But I remember, um, actually, did you hear the Jeff Gameface interview? I didn't listen to it yet. No, I'm like three weeks behind on you, or four weeks behind on you. Because he talks about their first show being with Inside Out. Oh, really? Yeah, and um, there's one interview I did where they were friends with. We talk about it because they're friends with Zach, and I don't think that's released yet. And they talked about how he's like super funny and he like he was political, but he wasn't that way when they, right. you know, he was that internally, but he wasn't so. It, yeah, it was just kind of crazy. So I thought when they said inside out, every time I hear inside out, I just think of you like just automatically think of you. Yeah, because that's you. how I found out about them, because you did that cover, which we'll talk to you about a second with that with jerk offs. You get up and sing the cover with them. Yes, but that was um, that that album also changed things for me. All right. So you're in a hardcore. You got back from Berkeley. And yeah. now how, cause I start going to County college of Morris and I take a job at hot topic. Okay. And then you went to the Matt Ellington show and then we, I think you and I, like we said hi, but I didn't really get meet you until went with, I went with Granick and I think Barker to your dad's house in Morris Plains. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. So you go to the Matt Ellington show and then like, what happened there? Did you, is that how you started like going to more shows that way? Or was it like become like part of your week, like weekly routine or. Pretty much. That was kind of it. I, you know, I knew Josh, um, Scott Dicker. And so he, you know, he, we worked at Hot Topic together. And so we always talked music and stuff and, and the rest of the, the, the gang that worked there. And so I think that's how kind of how I got sucked into going to more and more shows. Now, what I don't know exactly, and I can't trust Jay because he fucked up how I left the band in his <laughs> interview. So I can't trust him how I got in the band. But I do know this, that at some point, because Jay and I had gone to high school for one year together. I knew him from way back when. And somehow we reconnected. And his drummer at the time was a guy that I had gone to high school with, a, a good friend of mine that I had gone to high school with. And I don't know if that guy was departing or if he just wasn't around as much as they wanted him to be because he was at college. Um, 
somehow I took over the slot. I think I, maybe I like I filled in for a show and then they were like, you want to just have the gig? I don't know. Something along those lines. And all of a sudden I was playing in the jerk offs and it was great because I had the same name. We were both named Dave. So that was easy. Jay didn't have to change any like the, you know, the artwork. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so that was it. Like it was, it was solidified at that point. I was, it was Dave DeRizzo, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So this was, is this is a funny story. Drum. Yeah, I, I I didn't I met Dave when um, which Dave DeRizzo? DeRizzo, yeah, because he's the one you replaced, right? Yeah. Okay, so I met Dave uh, a couple years ago when my ex she opened up a CrossFit and he was a <laughs> member there. Yep. And I met him and he I remember him telling me he said yeah I play drums and he was he was a drummer for the band with the band at the time and he said yeah like I think he had mentioned knowing Jay. Um, and I didn't really put two and two together until Dave or until Jay's interview. And then he said, Oh, Dave DeRizzo. And I still, even during the interview, I was like, oh, okay. And then I was like, Oh my God, like fucking Dave. He was like, <laughs> I know the guy. I'm like, yeah, I used to do CrossFit with him. And he was like, yep. really nice dude. And he was a fucking good drummer. So yeah, it's a, it's a random story, but it's, I guess, you know, Jersey's very small. So, yeah, man. but okay. <laughs> so you replace him and then did, did so like when, when so I quick, actually quick, quick backup. Cause the band I was in before the jerk offs was this crazy goth band. And I'd also replaced Dave DeRizzo as the drummer in that band. So really, <laughs> most of my career was just following Dave around. And Dave would, <laughs> Dave would like write these songs and record with the bands and then somehow leave and I would be his backup replacement. So you're, thanks, you're Dave like DeRizzo. A, you're, you're like an ambulance chaser. You're just like <laughs> yeah. waiting to sneak in. Like, All right, yeah, yeah. Get. To this day, he's probably like, oh, Patino's going to take this gig from me for no good reason. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was the first drummer at Date the Fair and then you uh, you came probably. and <laughs> took his <Probably>. spot. <laughs> <laughs> so when I um, met you, you had your recording studio. So at what point yes. did you start like get what did what point did you get the idea that you wanted to actually record bands and then going in the direction? Because this is going to kind of parallel in conversation because you did all this at the same time. So I want to find a way to yeah. bounce back and forth. But I want to get into start how you started that. So I was into recording. Uh, obviously, I was trying to go to Berkeley for that. When I came back, and and I have a, uh, an uncle who at the time was a, a record producer, like a legitimate bona fide record producer and what's her face that you're, uh, uh the girl he did the uh well he did he's done a lot of girls no 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 but the one that um lisa uh, he, yeah he did the lisa Loeb. okay that's first two lisa Loeb records yes i just want to point that out to anyone's listening yeah. yeah yeah and so so i got to you know i got to be in studios and hang around he would take me to the studio and let me hang out as a young child which was amazing and cool and so so i was into recording i was into all the stuff and I actually bought his Tascam 688, which is a eight track tape cassette recorder. Um, I purchased it from him for $500 and I, that was my studio. I just built a studio around that. And so, but I really, the only reason I had it was because I wanted to record my band and my stupid songs at the time. And then I'm pretty sure it was like my girlfriend or somebody close to me was like, you should record other bands. And I was like, okay, $10 a, song or an hour or whatever the hell it was yeah you were mad cheap yeah well i mean you had to be i was in my dad's basement but you know but you could smoke and drink and and make music like make a real i mean like you know it's funny i actually just found a bunch of mix tapes in a box when i moved and i transferred them all to the computer and i was like you know what not bad for being in the basement everybody like (laughs) it's not great but it's not like you know i was like all right it's so, pretty good. So you're working at you're working at Hot Topic, and then all yeah. the money you're making is probably, I mean, not all of it, but I mean, if you're a drummer and recording stuff, it's like all your money typically goes to just all equi- of it, equipment, all of it. Plus, I'm you sure. did a build out too in the downstairs. Like you built that wall, and then a platform where your uh, your your board was on. Yeah, it was all found shit though, man. It really? was all like literally like garage sale. Uh, you know, like, oh, I found this uh, tabletop in the on the side of the road and these filing cabinets. Let's put, let's put the top, tabletop on top of the cabinets and there's my mixing desk area. And like, yeah, I, all of it was found stuff, honestly. Like it wasn't even the, even the wall that we put up was fake. It was just a lot of foam, really, and maybe a couple pieces of wood. Like <laughs> I just kind of made it happen as best as possible because um, like I had been to uh uh what's his name um portrait yeah like, chris he had like he had built fucking walls man like he had real walls in his garage like he built a real studio and i was like 
that'd be cool, but I can't do that. You know, like, and, and at CCM, like I had known Chris from CCM. He was in, he was in one of my classes or like assisted in one of my music production classes that I was taking there. And so, um, like basically like I, I used to go to, to Badami to, cause he had a CD burner, which was very high tech at that time. Yeah. And, um, I would take him, I couldn't afford a CD burner and the whole computer rig. So I used Sony mini disc, which was a digital format that died. And I would take him my mini discs and he would burn them to CD and then I could give them to my clients. I did that on a, on a handful of occasions. So when I met you, I, I I can literally visualize walking down the basement steps, turning to the right, and there was this dark basement where yeah. the, the board was all the way in the back right from the steps. Yeah. And then there was this makeshift wall here in the middle. Um, and then it was with Granite. Christmas lights. Yeah, the Christmas lights were up. And I think that, that was either before or after you had the giant um, swingers poster up. Mm-hmm. The movie mm-hmm. Swingers. And yep. yeah, Brian introduced us. And uh, yeah, that's how like we met. It was just yeah. randomly like that. We were, they remember smoking cigarettes down in your basement. So good. I don't remember what we talked about, but I think you're like, yeah, you like I saw you guys or some shit, and you're like, you're like the best band. I was like, I oh, know, thank you. No, no, get on. No, I was kidding. Um, that's, that's actually probably what you said because you were cocky. <laughs> I was, I was, oh man, this, a lot, this whole podcast has just been a lot of self-reflection on what a dick I was. Isn't that wild? <laughs> just, right? oh man, I'm like, I know. Oh, I'm so sorry to everybody for myself. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. It's hard to look back sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we were still figuring shit out, but I was like, I could have had a better attitude towards that. Um, what, uh, so how did you get in the jerk offs? So like this happened around the same time. Yeah. So like I said, actually, you know what? You just fucking painted the dots it's granick because granick worked at hot topic and he was friends with jay okay i didn't know you were so it was granick that got me in there oh okay so then like when you first started playing with those guys what were practices like um well so practices were so like jay said in his interview like we really were just trying to like have fun and hang out yeah. and play music and so like practices were um we we had that or we jay had that house rental situation on over on 181 yep by the time I 15 yeah yeah and so it was basically this guy's basement that let us just like practice and hang out there for i don't know like 100 bucks a month or something like that and he didn't really give a shit what we did so um yeah like there was a couple of beds there that we slept on and sometimes and at one point jay and i were like i think jay was living there full time but at one point like he was like you should come live here and i was like yeah i'm gonna move in i never did but <laughs> but yeah practices are basically like Smoking cigarettes, hanging out. Um, the guitar player, who, whose name I can never remember, uh, would never show up because he was too good to practice. He would just show up at the shows and then solo the whole time because <laughs> um, he was amazing. Huh? And and yeah, and Jay, Doug, and I would you know just like play songs. I don't even know if we actually even ever wrote any songs. I think all the songs we played were ones that Derizzo had written and stuff. I know. We always were trying to come up with clever covers, and so we would always um, – but yeah, and then we'd get like, you know, just silly enough that we'd all switch instruments and start playing Iron Maiden tunes. <laughs> and so I always used to play bass for like the Trooper, and and Jay would play drums, and yeah, it was – and Doug would play guitar and sing, and it was – you know, but that was practice. We were just like goofing around, and you know, we were learning songs, and we were trying to be good, but at the same time, it was just like, this is the most fun ever, and then 10 people would show up, and we'd crack open a bunch of beers, and – See you later. Well, as I was gonna say, like your bass, uh, the one thing I've talked about many times was your kick drum was just covered with those Guinness drafts or draft. How do you say that? Guinness draft draft. I believe, yeah. Draft. That was a that was a one weekend. Uh, that took me a weekend. Yeah, because I I asked you, you played a show. I'm like, what the fuck? You're like, oh yeah, we got together and we just drank it. So every every bottle yeah. I finished, I would just peel one off and I would just slap it on there. I'm like, yeah, the cooler awesome. had all the ice had melted, and so the water removed the labels, or it was easy to remove the labels. And I just kept putting them on the bass drum as we drank throughout the weekend. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was. I mean, it's absurd to think about, but um, you know. We we just love to we love to have a good time, man. That I was, was really just the end all be all. I kind of go back to the hot topic thing because I think again this is a very Jersey centric uh, mm. interview. I think people will understand. Like when I would go there, I was funny because all of the people working there were all of you guys went to shows locally. So I thought there was an authenticity to you know hot topic in general had such a stigma, even though we would always walk in there because I would just go right back to the CDs and see what they had because yeah. that was the easiest record store to go to. 
in Jefferson, it was 15 minutes away and instead of going all the way to Ponton Plains or, yeah. you know, sound exchange on 23. And we, so we'd go there and walk in and bullshit with you guys. And then we knew, and it was cool because we would, we met a lot of you guys at shows and you happen to work there. And then we met some of you guys because you're working there. Like, uh, I mean, Granick, you and Josh, I met at shows and then Sean, Mm-hmm. Lane Myers, John, I met him because he came to a show, a Matt Arlington show that one time. But did you guys ever feel like, like, like working there? You know, everyone was all worried about scene points back then. Remember all that shit? Like, did Not you ever, really, but yeah. Did you remember that at all? Like, people were like, you know, it was like a joke. You're like, oh, you're, 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 Jean, you're pan, you're, you're, you have like a studded belt on yeah. a white set of Josh would always, Josh would points. always joke about that kind of stuff. Like, did you guys ever get like shit for working at a Hot Topic? No, I don't, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like I, hot topic to me was like, Oh cool. I can do whatever I want. I can like, you're going to, you're going to not only just allow me, but you're going to congratulate me for dyeing my hair and wearing some stupid outfit to work. Like, <laughs> you know, for me, it was just like, cause I didn't really know. I still to this day sometimes don't really know who I want to be. And so like, I like to change things up. And so it was, that was just kind of the place where it was like, oh, it's like, oh, and I can get a discount on all this shit because I work here even better. Like, that's how I felt about it. I was like, cool, I need pink hair dye. It's right there. And you're going to give me 40 percent off because I work here. <laughs> like, that's what, you know, and I can get records that I or CDs that I can't get anywhere else. And I get to meet all these cool people. And yeah, I mean, like, and it's funny because we Hot Topic there, we had a very interesting crew. Most Hot Topics were very goth centric. Yeah. That was awesome. And we had a very like punky kind of crew we had a goth girl and she d. was d oh my god that was her name i couldn't yeah, remember she was one of the managers she was amazing like yeah. she was the best and you know and then there was that kid Corey, who was like eight feet tall who yeah. was kind of yeah who wore the jenkos with the 84 yep. inch bottoms all the time yeah you know like we had such a, and then there was kevin who was like hardcore and pierced and weird and, and then Aaron, uh, this was a, a couple of interviews ago. He he went to uh, my high school because he was one of the kids yeah. where I talk in the Chris interview about Mike Ziobro. He was the kid in our grade who just was light years ahead of any of us about right. punk rock and shit like that. And he was really good friends with Aaron, skinny Aaron, who, uh, God, I can't remember his name. He, um, he used to work there too. And I really, it's, 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 it's pointless information if I know this or not, but every time I say it, I'm like, Oh, what the fuck is his last name? Do you remember him? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> oh, God damn it. All right. Fuck it. Whatever. Yeah. No clue. Yeah. But it was like, you guys were Rockaway hot topic was the punk rock one. And then all the other ones I thought were more goth. Based. Yeah. If you went to Willowbrook, it was so goth. Man. Yeah. It was even darker. <laughs> I felt the store was like a lot more black and yeah, we kept it bright and we kept the music loud and yeah. You weren't allowed to have curses on, so we'd have to like jump for the CD player every five minutes. But you know, you know what it was like. Honestly, like I know we haven't talked about music a lot yet in this interview, but like I don't it, give a shit. for me, for me, it really was the environment that surrounded it. You know, like if it was just the music, like I can go home and do that, you know, by myself. It was really about like this cool group of people, this eccentric group of people that all came together, you know, because of because of that you know and it wasn't just punk rock it was all sorts of different stuff but yeah but that was the vibe of it was that it was you know it was very punk rock and it was very you know do it yourself and all that and now on the flip side i'll go right out and say it <laughs> holy fuck what a clicky bullshit crew we were <laughs> like, we were like oh we're so against the jocks and the blah 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 we were the same fucking thing oh the people in the scene yeah we were oh 100 thing like all the you know like uh, don't tell me what to do. I do it my own way. Like, that's great. But like, then, you know, like, I don't know, like practice what you preach. I felt like we were like, we're so much better than everybody else. Like, I don't that- know if it was a mixture of getting shit from people for so many years when you were in school for being different and then you wanted to give it back. Or it's just a, a way society works is once you find your, your, your tribe that you become, all right, well, this is my space now. And it wasn't the fact that they were jocks. It was just, oh, you don't dress like us, so go, go fuck yourself. So maybe they were doing the same shit to us that's just normal. I think so, yeah. It's totally normal. I just, I, you know, I I didn't, thinking about it, thinking back on it, obviously, now, I always think about it, and, and I'm always like, man, that really, like you, like you're like, wow, there's a lot of self-reflection. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. the fact that I was like, but, the fact that I was like so steadfast in my points 
Mm. You know, but like at the same time, like, wow, what an admirable thing to have something and hold on to it so strongly. Yeah. My delivery was wrong, but I'm really glad that the ethic was there to hold on to what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be and, you know, and, well, and, and all that. So. I, I think that might have been the difference because I thought that a lot of us, there was an authenticity where – yeah. When I remember, I, I started wearing Vans. Bob, who's Bob Michael, was like one of my great good friends. I mean, obviously, I'm just saying his name out because he listens to this and he'll be like, "Cool, he said my name." Um, he, I was at his house. It was when I first met Barker. Uh, he was really good friends with Bob, and that's how he introduced me to all these guys. And we, I was at Bob's when I was like 15 or 16, and I had this shit pair of shoes. And he goes, "Hey, I've got these old Vans, these blue Vans. I don't wear them anymore. I got green ones that I wear now. Do you want these?" And I was like, "Oh, we had the same sh- shoe session like that." I was like, yeah. And like, I put them on and it just, I was like, oh my God. It's like that moment, it kind of changed, changed my like perception or like, I felt like I was like going in the direction I was supposed to go. You know, it's like, like wearing I'm, women's underwear for the first time. Right. When I started doing that, I felt like, I was yeah. right direction. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like when you put on some of these clothes, it wasn't like the clothes yeah. I was wearing prior was what I was being told to wear by what I saw people wearing in school and or like my mom was like, you should wear this because it looks really like tre- preppy and nice. And, and right, I was right. never comfortable. But once I started going in that direction to becoming a scene kid or whatever the fuck, like punk rock, you know, whatever you want to call it, I felt more comfortable like that. And it was yeah. authentic. And so when I was buying clothes, it was, yeah, there was a, it was there's something funny about going to the Salvation Army in Dover and paying three bucks for a witty shirt that said like good banking is good people or right you know, Boy Scouts or some crap. But it was also, it, I felt like it was who I was, mm-hmm. you know? And I felt that's like what we all were. We did hold on to that because we were showing up as who we were. And I thought that the, the crowds that we didn't fit into, like, th- I felt like they weren't being authentic. Yeah. Right? It's like, oh, yeah. I have a football jersey because it's football. It's like, well, do you love playing football or do you just love being like a douchebag? Right. <laughs> You know, <laughs> even though yeah. like now I'll watch football every Sunday. I'm always at like a bar watching football. I'm like, I'm like, fucking love it. Kill them. Yeah. But, but back then I think it was just, it was the, it was the, the presentation, not the presentation. It was like the way that they presented themselves. They were just kind of like with aggression and we're like, man, like, why can't you just be cool with that? And I thought that's what we were. But I think that we kind of put up a wall because we're like, you're not allowed to back in this. You were, you were a douchebag to us. Right, right, right. And, and and on the flip side, I think we were douchey to a lot of people as well. Oh, 100%. I mean, yeah. I th- we became douchey to ourselves. You did. I no. did. Well, I think <laughs> there was there was something about being a 17, 18, 19-year-old kid who who I didn't ever have a place to fit in until high school where I met Chris and them. Sure. But I always felt like I was just like kind of fl- – I could float between groups of people and talk to them. But when you get up in front of a crowd and people come up to you and they're like, wow, we, and they have like, they're like a deer in headlights. Like, I love that song. Oh my God. It puts you in this weird space. You don't know what to say to that. Like, you're kind of like, oh wow, that's cool. Thanks. And then it kind of starts getting to your head after a while. Yeah. And then you become, and you become cocky about it. And, you know, and I think that's what happened to, I mean, definitely happened to me where I was like, I would still be, I still was cool people, but I would, it, it would get to my head. I'm like, okay, cool. We're going to play a song and you're going to sing it. And I, you know, it's like, I expect you to sing it now because I want this place to go fucking off. Right. So, and I, so what's funny is I, I've been blessed with this gift to hate everything that I do. <laughs> like I really, I think it's true. Like every time, every time anybody who knows me, will tell you this, every time I take a picture now or, you know, write a song or when I used to write songs, I would, I would write it. And I'd finish it and I'd be like, well, that fucking blows. Right. And then yeah. I'd play it for like three people and they'd be like, this is pretty good. It's not bad. And I'd be like, fuck you. It sucks. <laughs> and I would move on from it in, in you know, in a way. And, and so, um, so for me, like playing, like going out and playing shows and playing the music was like, yeah, it was, it was, you know, sure. It's fun to have people sing songs to you and it's fun to have a big crowded room, with, you know, people going nuts, but like, I don't know. For me, it was like all the in between, like maybe that's why I never consider myself part of it. Or, you know what I mean? Like, but like it was the group of people. It was just like meeting new people and moving on. Like, yeah. And I think when it became boring for me and when I left actually is it was the same fucking people every week. Interesting. You know, every week you go to a show and it was, it was the same fucking lineup. And the only difference was the touring bands. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it got real clicky for me towards the end because bands like the jerk offs couldn't get on the bill sometimes because we were, you know, taking our pants off and drinking beers. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, and they were like, ah, oh, you can't, you know, sorry, you can't open for Jimmy Eat world. If you're going to pull your wiener out, like, <laughs> Well, it's we also, like, it's like, you not? also, and there, you know, people are like, well, what's your draw? Like, Absolutely. how many kids are you actually going to bring to the show? Because we really need this. I, you know, and I'll be it's honest, though, like that. but Seriously. at the same time, though, you got to think from a promoter's standpoint where they're putting their money up. And I was talking the, into one guy and he goes, yeah, he goes, we'd be on tour. And if the promoter didn't fill the show, we would shake them down for the money they fucking owed us. Oh, absolutely. So I think there was a balance of like promoting bigger shows, knowing what's going to draw and like what, what you want to make it big. But also this nervousness of I got to pay this band a couple thousand dollars. So there's no right? fucking way you're opening because you draw what, five, ten people? You're not playing this right. fucking show. Exactly. Just because you take your wiener out doesn't mean I'm going <laughs> to bite you to, you know, like <laughs> – Oh, you wore a big cowboy hat and an afro. Yeah, come open my shit. Like, you know, that was Jay, not me, by the yeah, way. But, um, you know, but like, I, I get it. But like, at that point for me, it also, it became unfun. Well, it became like against everything that we were talking about. Like, we were trying to preach to us. Like, oh, it's right. punk rock, it's DIY. But then it became, oh, but it's not. It's a business. Yeah. Right. It became it's a business. Like, we became old enough that, you know, you either make money out, you either turn it into something you make money at, or you, I don't know, walk away from it. And, and, you know, and, and, and at the time, you know, I was nervous because I was like, wow, I really wanted to move out of my parents' house. I wanted to go start my own life, if that makes any sense. And yeah. like, I was trying to figure out how to just like do things. And, you know, I was just like depressed and unhappy and I didn't really feel like I was making good music at the time. And, and that's when I left the jerk offs. I remember, I, and I will tell the story now because Jay doesn't know what the fuck he's talking Wait, about. Wait, can you hold that for one second? I got to pee really bad. Just hold on. Go for it, man. So we took a small break there so I could urinate. Uh, <laughs> and fart. All right. So tell so it talked about the, had the, the breaking up the jerk offs. It was like, honestly, it was the saddest breakup I had had at that point in my life. I was how, really. How did, how did Jay describe it? Did he say, no, we just. Stop. Jay Go. said, Jay said, in, and I quote, because I'll never forget this motherfucker. He said, and I quote, that in true, you know, Dave Patino fashion, he just didn't show up to a show one day. Oh, that's right. As he was there, he was gone. And which would have been awesome. I wish I could have thought of that because that would have been the coolest exit from a band ever. <laughs> but I sat, it, it was outside the Lindhurst VFW on a very cold evening. We sat in that blue Volvo. And I broke up with him. I was like, I'm not going to play music anymore. I'm not going to play music with you anymore. Um, you know, I've got this, I'm going to go take this job or whatever. And I just, you know, I'm just not really into it anymore. I'm not, I'm not feeling it. And he was like, wow, that sucks, man. I'm really sad. And I was like, I'm sad too. And I'm just, you know, just need to kind of curb my life a little bit, you know, being, doing this stuff all the time and playing and, you know, and drinking and having fun and, Maybe I just need to settle down a little bit. And and that that was the breakup. It was sad. And I remember being like, wow, I'm not going to like I, I knew I knew that I was going to kind of lose Jay as a friend because the only thing that we had was that we played music together. Yeah. You know, and like and it was so funny. Like I I listened. I devoured his interview because it was my it was my time with Jay that like I always had that I missed like those long rambling conversations about <laughs> everything. Like that's why I love him and everything that he did you know and like and and he wrote quirky songs and he drew a hell of a fucking penis that kid could draw a dick like nobody else <laughs> you know and i thought that was like so funny i just thought it was hysterical <laughs> like and yeah so that that was it i just i kind of left um and this whole time period is real fuzzy you know <laughs> but like i just i kind of left i think i took a I took a day job, uh, like an actual office job, working in a medical office at that point. Wait, is that and, wait? It was this because you broke up with? Uh, this is right before you played in Lamar, though. Right, correct. So okay. yeah, maybe like I, I would say probably, I don't know, maybe within a half a year, I took the job with you guys. 
Okay, because you did the that same doctor's office. Wasn't that the one you always going back and forth with? You'd quit and then go back and quit and go back, or that just I quit once. Yeah, I quit once to go on tour with you fuckers, and then I went back, and, and they thankfully gave me my job back. Yeah, and then you worked there for a really long time until I came back to Jersey, and you were still there, right? Oh, I was. I and you hated I mean, it. You want to jump ahead? Yeah, I got married and I was twenty. What twenty? Man, I was probably – oh, no, no. It was before I got married. So I was I was like – I stayed 25. there until I was 21. So I probably stayed there for three years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Three, I mean, three and a half years. Because this is interesting to go into the like Lamar part because uh, I, I actually literally like after I was getting ready today to talk to you and I was like, oh, wow. I could talk to him about Lamar shit. <laughs> I like, was even part of like oh, why. Yeah. But I was like, man, there's so many good – I could love to hear that side of it. But I feel so bad. I haven't even interviewed Casey about it, but I don't want it just to turn into like 10 interviews about Lanemar, which yeah. it can happen because we had that many fucking members. I mean, well, technically, no. I, True. Sean, Chris, Alan. So three interviews so far have <laughs> talked yeah. about it. Um, but you, prior to this though, you recorded us. Um, so you were recording though at the same time and you did like, what was that band? We talk about this all the time, uh, but I always forget their name. The the band that Granick was in, where they came and recorded with you, and the guy never paid you. Uh, well, they paid eventually. Something <laughs> something kid or no? It was uh, it was um, it was Five Driver. No, it wasn't Five Driver. It was um, that other no? band that Granick was in. That they were from Ohio, and the guy was like you said in the recording sessions. Oh no, I recorded them for free. I loved them so much, I recorded them for free. Okay, that was it. And the guy, yeah, yeah. Like he, his girlfriend, that was Houseboy. Houseboy. Yes. It was Houseboy. Those guys were my bros for like six months. Okay. For, yeah. yeah, they I, I thought the world of Houseboy. Ace and, and uh Brett and whatever the hell the other guy's name was. Those guys were like they were just the best. Well, remember um, you, you remember you talking about the recording sessions and you said that because Ace was the singer? Mm-hmm. And you said that he during the vocal parts, he was going just like nuts. Just like jumping nuts. up and down and like nuts. Just I'd going never crazy. seen anything like it. Yeah. That, that that was that was cool to hear because that that I remember because we we recorded with you and like we were just very just docile like we weren't like that and I'm like man like maybe we're not yeah. that good if we're not jumping up and down like what Dave said like this guy was doing no not at all I, honestly it's not for everybody like it takes a special person to garner that much energy every time you sing a song yeah and and his voice you could hear it in his voice every time that kid sang you know he was spilling it for the world. He had a lot to say and not everybody can do that. You know what I mean? Like it, he was a, Ace was a, just a special guy and a hell of a singer. And he just wrote some really, him and Brett wrote some really clever tunes. And I, I really just wanted to be a part of that record. Honestly, I love those guys so much. I was just like, let's just do it. Let's record some shit. And we actually finished recording that record, which never came out. Um, yeah, I was going to say that. Never released it, but they, we finished recording it at like, 3 a.m. and they left they left to move to chicago at like 9 a.m that yeah night. that's right because his girlfriend at the time was pregnant she might have been yeah or his wife they, they were, were married i believe she was definitely married. yeah yeah, yeah granick went with them and i i slept i okay ready i slept on the floor of the studio that night um waiting for the mix down because he had to play it in real time obviously yeah waiting for the mix down to hit the mini disc um, so I could take it to Badami's so he could burn a CD. And then I went to work at 8 a.m. with like two hours of sleep. <laughs> That's how shit was back then. I mean, you were, you, when you did stuff, I always felt you were burning the candle at both ends. Have to. I still do it to this day. Yeah, you definitely still do it to this day. <laughs> the best way to live. <laughs> for me, not for everybody. But... So, if any, know, yeah. It's possible. That's how I felt at that time. I was like, oh, cool. Like, um, but yeah, I ended up getting to record a lot of cool people who had a lot of big ideas and pushed me to be a better, uh, I'll say, but engineer for lack of better words. You know, yeah. I recorded, it pushed me to figure out how to record better. Like, you know, recording Five Driver, like, you know, Zach Neal, that guy just, he had the record in his head already. And, and he just needed, you know, he needed someone to put it on tape for him. And, you know, I remember him coming to me and being like, I, I need this delay. You know, and at the time it was, it was digital, but it was analog. You had to program the fucking milliseconds in between and we weren't playing to a click track and like, uh, you know, but he pushed me to like, just keep going, keep going, keep, you know, take your time, try it out. And like, same thing, you know, he would record this stuff and they had that drummer at the time who ended up playing with Big Wig afterwards. Oh, really? What was his name? 
I didn't know that. Yeah. I know that a guitar uh, player, I know Adam from the Overdrives, I think he played with Big League too. I thought. Maybe. Keith. Keith something. Was yeah, Keith. Yep. Keith was fuck of a drummer, man. And like, but those guys were so good and they just like, I, I got to record a lot of really good bands that should have gone to a real studio, but ended up in my basement because I was like, yeah, whatever. Like, it's cool. And, you know, and sometimes there'd be a, like an argument like, hey, you owe me $40 for the last four days of work. <laughs> Yeah. You know, like, come on. And, but I had a day job and so I was making money. I lived with my fucking parents. So it didn't make any you know, difference really in the long run. And it was just cool. I got to, I got to be around a lot of music and make a lot of music. And, and then that's, you guys I actually didn't record till I was in the band. Really? Oh, that's yeah, right. Yeah, Cause yeah. I think we want, well, well, which is part of, I think it was part of the reason I got into Lane Myers. Cause you guys were like, well, this guy's got a small studio. Like, <laughs> let's take advantage of this. I think we might have. Um... Because I was a shit guitar player. Well, I remember I I I, I remember Ra- Heiner left before he got when we were going to kick him out. So he played his last show in Wayne, and then we were like, "Well, fuck, we need a guitar player." And I think no, Andy didn't. No, Andy joined for a minute after Sean quit. So you, right, right. When I when I went to drums, Andy played guitar. Right, and that's how we we that's the original recording of Broken Dream. Yeah. That's when we first yep. played that show in New York State, where we played it for the first time uh, with yep. Weston. Actually, um, yeah, it, it was next to that porn shop. Yes. Binghamton, a great porn shop. It was in Binghamton, that's right. Yeah, I don't remember the hall. I don't remember the, the the venue much, but the porn shop next door was <laughs> top notch. <laughs> but I don't remember at all how we got you in Lane Myers. So because Rob quit, we Alan, we kicked Alan out. We got Rob. Yeah. Rob to Rob and didn't work out with Rob, and he left. Right. And then you came in the band. However, because we were ready to go on tour, we had done two tours with Rob, and we had another one lined up in January or December, yeah. February, January, February, and we're like, we're going out to the Midwest and down to Florida. We need a guitar player. And I don't know how the conversation happened, but you somehow you got in the band. I came. I, came I actually like. I did like. It was so weird because I actually did like a. You guys were looking for a guitar player, and you were like, "How about?" I don't know if it was you or Chris or whatever. You were like do you want to try out? Or I was like, oh, let me try out. But like, there was an actual tryout. Like yeah, we went to backstage, the whole, right? Yeah. Backstage. And like I played and then it was like 11 o'clock on like a Sunday night. And I remember I had to go to work the next day and I was like, so like, what do you guys think? And they were like, Oh, you guys are like, Oh yeah. You, yeah. You're, you're in the band. I was like, okay, well I just need to know cause I have to quit my job tomorrow. <laughs> and you guys are like, you're going to quit your job. And I was like, well, <laughs> dude, we're going to go on the tour for fucking three and a half weeks. I can't just like, not like not show up for work for i <laughs> remember weren't we sitting outside on our cars after we like we left the place and we we're talking because that was that's the way it always went we'd practice get kicked out because our time was up we'd go outside yeah. pack our cars and sit on our trunks or lean against our cars smoke cigarettes and talk about what the next steps were exactly and that's what we did holy shit and it was, and it was basically like yeah okay you're yes of course you're in the band and uh Let's start rehearsing. I think we, you know, that was probably like in December and we were leaving, I don't know, maybe a month later to go on tour. Yeah. And then you showed up with that green BC Rich metal guitar. It's my only guitar at the time. Didn't, wait, did you try it with that guitar? And then you bought yeah. the Black Ibanez? Bought the Black Ibanez the day before we left for tour because I was like, yeah, I should probably have a backup. Yeah. And I remember and seeing that. so it was that. like a hundred bucks. Yeah. It was a yeah. like hundred bucks and Dorian and I <laughs> stayed up all night putting stickers on it so it didn't look like a brand new Ibanez. <laughs> Because yeah. we, we showed up that morning, I saw the, that picture of the four of us in front of the blue and white van is mm-hmm. is the the shot before we got in the van and started driving south. I remember, and there was a giant snowstorm, and we Huge weren't supposed snowstorm. to fucking yeah. leave. Yeah, yeah, we went south, and we remember we passed by on oh, whatever in Virginia the the cigarette place where Marlboros are made. Oh yeah, the main factory. That we stopped I got a picture there. in front of there too. But you guys went in and actually bought like cartons. I thought because they were cheap. I bought cartons everywhere. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so what? What from your perspective? And I don't want to like spend like hours talking about Lamar. Um, yeah. I want to hear your side of it because that tour ends with uh, us kicking Sean out and and him leaving at the same yeah, time. Yeah. Not and, playing the same the last show. Not playing the last show at Planet Trog. Yeah. And, but like the whole time and I, and the Kentucky thing, I forgot about that, but like, what was going on in your mind when you were on the road with us? Cause I, I, I want to hear that perspective. Of shit. So the, uh, what's funny is I said it all to you. 
I said it all to you and I said it all to Chris and I said it all, well, Sean wasn't there. I said it all to you and Chris in an empty field across the street from Planet Drog. And I cried. I'll never yes. forget this. I cried my eyes out because I had, I, I, I had quit my job. I, I, I thought like, oh, this is, these are, this is a group of guys that I want to spend some time with and I want to make some music with because I like the music that they're making and I think that they are going to make even better music as time progresses. And so I want to be a part of this. And so I left my life. I like left my job and, and I don't know if you remember, but like there, there was like a girl before that that I was like maybe going to get married to for like a quick second that I knew and 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 you're when you guys were like come play for our band and go on tour I was like yeah yeah this is all good like get me out of this I actually thought that Lane Meyer was going to be like in, in, don't take this the wrong way like my ticket out like I thought like Interesting. oh cool we're, we're going to do this for a while let me put it that way I yeah. didn't think we were going to make millions together or even thousands together but I thought that I thought that this was going to be the thing that I was going to focus on, you know, at, at 20 years old. Yeah. Cause I was 20 when I joined the band and I thought this is it. And three weeks later I was like, what a bunch of fucks. Like <laughs> I've never seen so many people yell at each other so often in a three week period. Yeah. You know, like, and yet at the same time I had fostered relationships with each of you individually. Yeah. You know, like, you and I always got along. We were fine. I didn't really, Sean and I had worked together at Hot Topic. So like we were cool, but like, I didn't really know Chris, but then like, you know, I ended up like having to, like, I was Chris's like bedmate. I felt like I, maybe it was weird. I felt like he always snuggled with me. Like, cause he didn't want to snuggle with Sean, obviously, cause they hated each other at the time. Yeah. And I think you, he had maybe just run, run his course with you. But like, so yeah, I was like his new snuggle bug bedmate on tour, <laughs> you know? Especially like when it was cold and we had to sleep in the rider truck, he'd be like, I'll sleep with Dave. And I was like, Whoa, easy there. That You said that fast. <laughs> but like, but I felt good about it at the same time. I was like, cool. I'm building these relationships with these guys. I felt like I was a part of the band. Um, and Chris kept trying to like, get me to take on more guitar parts. I remember like in Ohio, like he sat with me and, and he was like, yeah, yeah. Like you need to learn this. So like you can play this part. And I was like, well then, but that's your part. Like that's the Chris Barker octave slide thing yeah. and he was like yeah but you should play and and i felt like i was like okay cool and then and then the whole thing just like kind of ended in a really poor uh showing of emotions um by all of us you know i'm not excluding myself from this it's just you guys were the core of it <laughs> so yeah no, that was we... it i just I, I really felt like I, I i mean i'll never forget standing in that field crying and kind of yelling a little bit and being like i, I gave up my fucking life to come do this and you guys like you guys are just like not into it. Like you guys don't care about each other. And we didn't play that show. And I actually didn't, you and Chris drove home in the rider truck on your own. And I went home with Dorian. She drove me home because I had no, showered. No, 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 What? We, we, the three of us drove back from planet Trog to your house. Oh, it's my, cause my we, house. Sorry, we yeah. unloaded. And, you, and then you guys broke the rider truck after that. Well, no, we, we it just died, which was great <laughs> because we got all our fucking money back. We had $1,400 or something to rent this fucking thing. And this thing literally died on the exit on route 15 before getting onto Weldon road to go down. And, they didn't charge it. And, so good. Yeah. and they also actually think they gave us 300 extra bucks because there was water leaking through the roof. And Chris said, Oh yeah, that, that broke one of our amps. So God bless went, Ryder. <laughs> yeah, and because his it was his, I think it was his credit card that we used in Florida when the fucking blue and white uh, van died oh, down man, there man, yeah. at Casey's house. Man, god damn, that's so nuts. Because I'm looking at the pictures right now on the Lane Meyer uh, Facebook. Oh, that's page. funny. And it's got the Ryder truck, and I forgot that that's what we toured with the Lounge for a hot minute. Yeah, and I thought that Brian yep. wanted to kill me in the very beginning and then he like ended up liking me at the end he was a big guy man yeah he did not <laughs> like me in the first couple of shows i think i made a joke oh really like, oh yeah i he gave me this look like he wanted to just just step on me when we first Could and i was like oh and then at the end i totally won him over because you know that's what i do uh, yeah you know, <laughs> turn on the charm tell me about this kentucky thing so what happened was i had this uh job in a medical office and i had been very um uh, regimented in my behavior and the way I looked and everything. Cause I was trying to like, just, you know, make money and make a living. And when I joined Lane Meyer, after having been out of the scene for like eight months or whatever, I, I took this as, well, I'm not working for the next month. You know, I can do whatever I want again. And so I, I 
I think I turned my hair orange the night before we left for tour. Yeah. Yeah. I actually remember my parents coming in to say goodbye to me before I left for tour. They were like, what the fuck happened to you? We went to bed last night with regular hair. And I was like, oh, yeah, I bleached it after. Oh, yeah, it's all good. (laughs) But, yeah, so we ended up in Kentucky, and we were hanging around. We were playing at a pizza place that night. We were hanging around waiting to go there, and we're just walking around downtown and downtown lexington or wherever the hell we were yeah i forgot and, um yeah it was like out of a movie like a truck drove by and it was hey faggot your orange hair blows or whatever and of course we all were like hi you know like we waved back like assholes because <laughs> that's you know kill them with kindness punk rockers and and they fucking turned that car around and we were like oh it was all of us it was us and lounge yes like, it, it was during the daytime time. too Oh, it was fucking like one o'clock in the afternoon and we went running and we ended up hiding that's right inside some sort of weird movie theater kiosk area and we finally got rid of them but and we all laughed we all thought it was hysterical <laughs> i do that happened remember to me that. now i'd be like crying in the corner but like yeah we were like <laughs> <laughs> but i also had that going back to you know what we talked about originally which is like i had that feeling of like there's fucking 10 of us like either we're all getting our ass kicked or like that's it it's all or none you know like we're all together in this and uh, sorry i'm the asshole with the orange hair but um (laughs) you know it was gonna be okay like and that was cool and you know then we played another shitty show and moved on to the next town so (laughs) do it that was the pizza place where i had the the stage was not a stage but it was like three steps down so you were below the audience yeah yeah Yeah. oh dude yeah dangerous that was when uh the homeless guy told chris he was ugly I don't remember that. I that do actually, remember no, that, that might have been what we played there with Heiner the previous tour. And some homeless guy, he was like, hey, man, he's like, you're fucking ugly. And Chris that's, is like, well, at least I got fucking teeth. Uh, that sounds like Barker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was such a dick thing for the guy to say. I was like, well, well I guess if I I'd think that way, I also woke up at uh, 10 a.m. and started drinking bourbon. Hey, man. You know, <laughs> you got to yeah. have hobbies. Yeah. You know, you got to do something when you're. Look at look at Jay. Practice. He wakes up at 11 and drinks bourbon. I, I talked to him after his interview. He's like, ah, maybe I should have cut back in the bourbon. I was like, fuck no. That was so great. Um, oh, man. But so yeah, like, so that yeah. was, uh, that, you know, that tour, when we came back from that tour. Um, Sean and left and we, with, you played. Yeah, Sean left and I was like, I actually said to you guys, I was like, well, I'm really a drummer. So why don't you just let me play drums? Yeah. Yeah, and, and then, then hire another guitar player. Well, then we got you to play drums and that's when we started going in the emo direction. Like really emo direction where Chris had that well, one started, slow song that yeah, wasn't it was on lot. any albums and we recorded yeah we started recording all that stuff in your basement yeah we recorded a shit ton and and you recorded some like kind of solo stuff that ended up you know showing up and yeah it was just it was cool like and I think it opened up a, a lot of avenues for you know whatever whatever you guys wanted to do because I didn't really write I never consider myself like a songwriter in 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 lane liar or whatnot and and but chris would always you know he'd show up and be like i got this song and then, you know or you'd show up and you'd be like like energy like you showed up and you're like i got this thing yeah and you and i worked out energy before yeah, anybody was ever in the room we wrote the whole damn song yeah we did i remember that yeah we were down in your basement and yeah. the, the christmas lights on yeah because I, I was like i got this riff and you came up with like that that intro part to like that like random that off- offbeat that started it off yeah, yeah. We, we wrote and, but like, hold on though. Like the one thing I, I definitely want to point out though is that it was a different dynamic because Sean is a very like straightforward, like hard hitting, and he still wasn't confident in his in his drumming, which we have talked about in fucking. I remember. Yeah, yeah, I heard it. You know, length. Um, but at that point, you've been playing since you were three, so you just kind of had this different. You, you totally, to, two totally different drummers, which is why I think the sound went in that different direction, that more you know technical emo thing because we because you that was like your style and we were kind of writing our songs to that i thought so i think yeah. you saying you didn't write the songs i think you had a huge hand in writing energy broken dream um broken dream for sure because yeah. I, I mean chris was like you know he wanted to blow all the guys in mineral and i yeah. think broken dream was his his chance to write a song that kind of resembled something that mineral might do on a bad day well he tried it as well there's like <laughs> what there's that other slow song that we played that yeah we, that's a, it's all in six eight or whatever and yeah and that was the time that was yeah. the first and only six eight song i think we ever wrote maybe <laughs> and, it, and it never was seen the light of day since no it's, um, i think it's on the archives is it really yeah it's um it's funny. and i'm not gonna like hold on to this too long but 
I, th- I think it is on there, but I, I know I saw it somewhere. Ah, fuck, where the I have no idea. Actually, we wrote Grover's Corners together too. The rock song. Dan it, Dan it, Dan it. Oh, I do remember that. Yeah, because we recorded that. Because the the two songs that we remember when Adam. Oh, who? Okay, who is that fucking asshole that came and stayed with us? Because he was the record label, and you and you we, we recorded, and you were like, oh, dude. you guys showed up at my at my house or my condo, and you dropped off. You're like, get this fucking guy away from Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Yeah. That, he was from uh, Chicago, I think. Or was it that or LA? I was like, uh, maybe LA. I, he was not from New Jersey. Yeah, he, he had flew taken in. a plane, and I had had enough of him after ten minutes. Oh, he was he was so fucking annoying. He was horrible, and he offered nothing, like. He offered nothing, nothing in terms of like money, nothing in terms of like I have a connection or nothing in terms of like, I just really like your band. He was just, I don't know. like he was No, he was there. supposed to be our label. Like he was going to. No, I know. Was, but like he had nothing to offer. I, I know. I know. He was like all bullshit. And the guy su- like flew out to see us. and We're like, so what the fuck are you doing here? Like we couldn't get that guy on the plane any faster. Oh, I remember Barker and I just like to this day, like Barker and I will still look at each other the same way when we see people that we don't like it. But I was just like. It was the first time we did it, and we were like, okay, we're on the same page. This guy's got to go, but we can't say he's got to go. Yeah. So we'll just keep staring at each other until we figure out how to get him to go. <laughs> okay, let's, let's just <laughs> stuff him in the car and drop him off at Doyle's mom's condo and just say, Dude, it made perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. I was like, why the fuck are you guys here? I think it was like 9 in the morning or 10. It was, it was super early, too. And I, was had, like, I think he – had he stayed at my house that night? I yeah, think he, he stayed at my house the first over. night. Yeah. In the, in the studio. He slept in the basement. Yep. Ugh. holy fuck yeah out of all the people i've talked to in interviews i'm like yeah well, you know maybe they're nice people right i'm sure this guy is but i was like oh fuck that guy was like i don't, I don't remember his name I, I, I just you know you know what it was let's get into it real quick yeah. the whole fucking record label thing all those guys who had record labels back then and i'm not saying all of them because a lot of them actually had legitimate labels but a record label is a bank okay you have one thing to offer a band and that's money Okay, because the band can't make their own record, they can't print it, and they can't release it. So what you have is the money to do that. That's what a record label is. And so coming from the world of like, you know, having family members that are in the record industry, I was like, oh, cool, you guys got record labels? That's awesome. And then I'd be like, uh, you know, like, so, yeah, so like, what, do we have a budget? And they'd be like, well, there's no budget. And you'd be like, well, okay. So, so you're going to distro it at least, right? So like we'll what would you say you, know. you do here? <laughs> right. So, yeah. And it basically became like, what it became was, well, I thought of this clever name and I made a logo and I just want you to put it on the back of your tape cassette. Yep. And I was like, oh, well, I guess you can do that because it's going to cost us anything. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, like, yeah. I had, I had like, you know, it was that, and that's how that guy was to me. I was like, did you just have like a free ticket to New Jersey and you needed a place to stay or like, what? I don't know. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was You're here to sign it. us. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> yeah. This is a, so like all this random shit basically was happening. This is one of the, this is like kind of like the, one of the valleys of the band. And then be- right before you left, I did you a favor by leaving. I think. I think I did you a huge favor by leaving because I had a feeling that like somehow I was going to take Lane Meyer down in some weird way. I don't think so. I think it was weird because I think at that point we didn't have any direction and our direction was, our direction was Sean, like Sean, he was, I'm going to book, we're going to show up and play. Something's going to happen. And we're like, great. We, you know, with us, with you, me and Chris, and then Andy jumped in for a minute Chris, we put the reins on him and said, hey, all right, you're booking the shows. He's like, oh, I got this. And Sean didn't know what he was doing. I'll do it. And then he realized really quickly like what a bitch it was. Oh, and yeah. he tried to book that tour, and it was just going to shit. And um, then we were like, wow, I, we didn't realize how much we needed Sean from the business aspect of it. Not, and then from a drummer side of it, we never knew how to like become a band and stop yelling at him. Right. <laughs> and, like just right, be right, like, right. you know? Um, so when... I remember you quit. I showed up, and I think I, I remember this. I don't know why I remember this. My departure, you can blame part of it on Brian Granick, actually. Really? Yeah, because so I I had motherfucker. I, <laughs> I'm just kidding. He has nothing to do with it. No, he um he actually I I talked to him and I was like, man, I'm just I don't know, like 
I'm just not really feeling it right now. And I'm kind of tired of like the same punk rock beat over and over again. Like we were starting to write songs like Broken Dream and a couple others. And I was like, you know, just, I don't know. I just want something a little different. And and I remember Brian called me and he was like, um, you need to go on the Jade Tree message board. Jade Tree Records had a message board at the time. That's what I was just going to say yeah. is that and he I was like, you need in. to go on the Jade Tree message board. Yep. And um, Ari Katz yep. has a thread up there. He's looking for a zero, drummer. Zero. And, yeah. zero zero and you should go play it doesn't it didn't even have a name at that point and so i i i did i went on behind everybody's back and i was like hey or I, it felt like i was going behind backs so it felt like at that point a band was like a relationship to me but i didn't realize that you could play in multiple bands at the same time yeah yeah i didn't realize that that was a thing and so i you know i went behind everybody's back and i i message boarded um ari and i was like hey man like blah 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 and he called me and very like nonchalantly you know, cause he's a, a, a laid back guy and a, and a down to earth guy. And he was like, yeah, you know, we're doing this thing. And he talked to me all about it. And he was like, you know, I used to be in this other band. He's like, I don't know if you ever heard of it. <laughs> you know? And I was kind of like, uh, yeah, oh, possibly uh, lifetime. Like, okay. <laughs> um, but I was like, yeah, I was like, I, I was like, I, yeah, I know of lifetime. I was like, and, and you know, kudos to you. Nice work on that. And he was like, oh, cool. Thanks. He was like, yeah, he's like, basically I want to go in the exact opposite direction. And I was like, awesome. Count me in. I, I would love to see what that sounds like. And so I drove to Red Bank um, and I picked up a cassette tape from him. And he was like, go learn these songs. I, you know, we recorded these four songs, five songs, whatever it is. Go learn them and come back and play with me. And I was like, cool. And so I came back home and I listened to the tape uh, on the ride back, actually, from Red Bank. And I was like, well, this is definitely not Lifetime. <laughs> it was yeah. like, yeah. And it was awesome, though. I was like, yes, I want to be a part of this. And so I came home and listened to it, and I played to it for like a week. And I quit Lane Meyer. You came over and sat on my front steps, and I smoked a cigarette, and I was like, I'm leaving the band. I don't want to play that kind of music anymore, and I think I might go play with Ari Katz. And you were like, what the fuck? Good for you. Fuck you. Like, you – I remember you couldn't – like, you were happy for me, but you were like, fuck you. (laughs) I was I think yeah. just excited that I was like that I was that, I, that there was a possibility that I might play in Ari's band. I think I that. did say <laughs> I think I literally said good for you. You did. You I, totally did. Yeah. Everybody else like Chris fucking left the house. Chris walked in, we were downstairs. <laughs> I go, so Dave's leaving. He looks at me, looks at you, turns right back around and leaves. Just walked out. Just yep. left. He's like fuck this whatever and he leaves and I'm like, uh I think I, I think I even ran after him. I was like, I'll be right back. You did. Yeah. And that was actually the last time I talked to Chris for like years. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because after that, I kind of, I mean, well, so. You didn't really uh, go I'll, to shows and shit after that. Like you kind of broke from the scene, I thought. I stopped playing music altogether. That was it. So so the, the quick end to this story is you guys left that night. You and I said, we'll talk to each other soon. Yeah. Um, I spent about another week playing along to uh you know the whatever demo it was and and then all of a sudden i was like you know what i'm not gonna i'm i'm not playing music anymore i wasn't in a good place and i just you know had all these ups and downs and i was like i'm not i'm not doing this and so i called i called ari and i was like hey man thanks so much i was like i'm really sorry but like i i love the record i was like i love what you're doing i was like but i'm just i'm not gonna play anymore and i drove back down to red bank and brought him the cassette tape and it, it stood in his record store. Wow. And he said to me, the guy, I mean, the guy didn't know me from a hole in the wall. He had never ever played with me. And he sat for probably 12 minutes and pleaded with me to play music. <laughs> I swear to God, I was like, I'm just, I was so depressed at the time. And I think part of it was just like, I had hopes for Lane Meyer and I had hopes for where I was going to be at that point in my life. And it was very like, just, it was much bigger than, you know, the bands at that point, what was going on inside my head. And I, and I was just like, yeah, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of done with music. I'm just going to give it a break for a while. And he sat there and he was just like, dude, you can't give up on music. Like you got to keep playing. And I was like, I, you know, and he was like, dude, you don't even have to like, just come play with us one night. Just see what happens. And I was like, nah, I'm just, thanks man. Like I really, and I shook his hand and he was like, Hey man, you know, like stay in touch or if you ever want to play, like give me a call. That's, that was basically his last words to me. And I walked out of there. Dorian was with me, my girlfriend at the time. And we, we drove back up to fucking, you know, an hour back to North Jersey. 
and part of me was like, wow, you might have just walked away from something that could have been cool. And part of me was just like, now nah, you're doing what you need to do right now. Yeah. And that was it. I stopped playing music. I moved out of my parents' house shortly thereafter. I got my own apartment. And I didn't talk to any of you guys for years until uh, I came to an Arcade Academy show. I thought, and, uh, hold on, I thought that Well, you, you and actually, I, sorry, sorry, sorry. You and I recorded a few times in the months after that. Sorry. Did we? And we, yeah, yeah. You and I recorded a couple things. We chatted here and there, but then we kind of lost touch and you moved to California and then we didn't talk for, for years. Well, oh, that's, yeah. And not it, because we didn't yeah. like each other. We just, no, it's, you know, it was, well, we, we just also, lost touch. Well, you know? we also didn't have the, the social media connection and that's what really connected us. I thought, because mm-hmm. I came back and played our Arcade Academy show. I thought, no, wait. <laughs> um, yeah, I came back, played that show. You showed up there with Jane at the bar we were playing at. And then you and I stayed in contact because you were living in Bootin and I was in Lake Hiawatha at the time. And we didn't realize how close we were. I was married. Somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like, because, yeah. no, but that's the, all right, now it makes sense. You know, you did talk to Chris because you you quit we got Sean back. We went on tour with Humble. Sean came back. We toured for a little bit. And then you and I stayed friends because we went to Dave Brown's house yeah. for a party. And then Chris came over. Uh, so That's you did true. see Chris. That's then. true. So, yeah, we talked. Okay. So we did. We did. But yeah. barely. I mean, and, like then, we didn't have the- and then you were at the party where when Chris left, I had that party in my condo. And you and Andy yeah. and him surrounded me. And you're like, oh, we're going to make our own Landmeyer band. And I was like, I'm not ready for this. And you guys were joking Actually, around. you know what's funny? I was really even though I was, you know, uh, hammered, I, I remember being really upset leaving that party at your house because, um, you guys had come out with a new record and, and broken dream was on there. And like, I'll never, it was like stupid, you know, early twenties, drunken upsetness, but like you guys credited Andy for writing that guitar line, but there was no mention of me anywhere. And I was like, but I sat with Chris and work that song <laughs> I, was I, like, I really was like oh man i thought i thought for once i had like a say in something and then i was like fuck that <laughs> wow that's crazy it, yeah, it was we, hysterical we though gave was andy the riff. Hysterical. that's right Holy as shit. you should because andy came up with that fucking riff man well, that was great yeah i mean it was also yeah that's true because that was like the that was the glue in the end of that song like bing, totally bing, 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 bing. yeah yeah but it, so you know it was just yeah, so we, I mean, I, I truncated it a lot, but like, yes, we talked a little bit more, we hung out more, but but really, I kind of just like up and left. I moved, you know, I, I, I went full time with that job. I got a bunch of, you know, promotions. I got into day jobness. I met my then to be wife, and I kind of left the scene behind me at that point. You guys were all still going. And, you know, like fast forward years, like, yeah, I came to the Arcade Academy show, and we kind of caught back up a little bit. And, you know, we hung out. You came to my house, we watched TV, and, drank wine with my wife and at the time and did this and that. And, um, but I didn't really do much and it wasn't until I, uh, started to get divorced from that woman and yeah. Lane Meyer did a reunion in uh, Montclair yeah, and that's right. I was technically solo and I was like, I'm going to go to this. And I went to the, to the reunion show and, we, and you guys played and I took like a couple pictures on my shitty camera and we ended up at Mason street pub afterwards until like one o'clock in the morning. And actually, oh, yeah. uh, Chris's wife yeah, was, the, yeah. under, was, she couldn't get in the bar and so starting to court her. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, but like, and I was like, Oh cool. Like we're all still friends. Like I felt like, Oh good. It's, you know, we're all still cool here and it was great seeing everybody. And that was fun. And, um, and then we kind of, stayed in touch a little bit. And then I, I think a couple of years later was the uh, day at the fair reunion in Maxwell's. Everybody got together or no, it was not yeah. the day, at the day at the fair last show. I should say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Last show ever. And, uh, one of the last shows ever. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and, and I caught up with everybody there and I was like, Oh, well this is cool. Like, um, and there was that crazy girl there that, that, uh, you were like, wow, you, how long have you been dating that girl? And I was like, Oh, I just met her like five minutes ago. And you were like, what? Oh, who um, the fuck was that? Yeah. It was a weird night. <laughs> um, That's that Maxwell's, right? Yeah. It was so bad. Yep. And so, yeah. So, I mean, you know, that, that was kind of my exit from the scene though. It was to steal from, from, from Jay Blanda. It was as quickly as I came into it. I left the scene. I literally was just kind of like, Oh, I'm done playing music. 
And I stopped. Like the second I moved out of my parents' house and got into an apartment, I left all the equipment in their basement. And that was it. I just walked out. I, I kept my guitars, but I didn't really play them. I didn't play drums anymore. It was probably a good 10 years that I didn't play music. I think that kind of happened, though, across the board, right? Like, but, like, you kept going. Like, you were on tour. Chris moved out to, you know, uh, Los Angeles. And then, you, and then you were out in Los Angeles. And he was working for the label. And he was doing Day at the Fair. And yeah. Like, I remember like, turning on MTV and hearing Day at the Fair. Oh, that's right. It was the MTV Music Awards. I remember yeah, um, it was like it, it was something it, something like that. It was kind of like the intro. Yeah, they, they, it was on a it was an award show where it was going to the credits or coming back from the credits where they're scanning the room and you hear in the background the. Uh, yeah. You can cut through the bone with. Oh my, like I, I the, was like, yeah. And then, like years later, you know, like when I was divorced, living in Bootin by myself, I remember like falling asleep on the couch and waking up to pure. Gabe Supporta singing on MTV. Like it was like a proper music video on MTV. And I was like, well, oh, Cobra Starship's like a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was like, and, and part of me was like, wow, good for those guys in their own right, you know, whatever whether it be Cobra Starship or Day at the Fair or or Lane Meyer or wh- whatever it was. I was like, man, those guys kept playing. I was so jealous. I was like, they kept playing music. Damn it. Well, if you would have got if you would have gone back to that time, right? Like knowing yeah. what you know now, what what would you have like? I would have left even quicker, man. Interesting. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I honestly though. Or what I would you change? Like what? The like, path like, took, but the path that you wanted to take was to play music at that point, right? Yeah, that's what all you, I wanted to do. Do you think like it was just? Do you think it was just going to work out the way it was going to work out? Or if you had just had the right conversation with someone, you would have spent ten years touring in a bigger band and actually because you you're a really good fucking drummer like anyone saying dave is a phenomenal drummer and i think I, I think you could easily have gone to a band that really needed you like ari was one thing but he was starting from scratch which is could be a suicide you know for like no one gives sure. a fuck when they show up they're like just play lifetime songs we don't want to hear zero zero yeah. um it, it would be it's like i feel like you could have joined a band that like the dude did with my chem, right? Where their drummer, yeah, yeah. another guy jumped on and he just rode the fucking wave. Sure. In, you know, in my, from my perception. If only Dave DeRizzo had had a really good band that I could have <laughs> stolen away from him. <laughs> you just still just follow him. Like, dude, That's, what are you doing? Yeah. I think he is still playing music, actually. I know. I follow him on Facebook. and I think Of course you do. Guys. You're always I there. Should, You're always I watching. I that band. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what are you doing, Dave? I want to be drummer for that band. Uh, yeah, so, no, I honestly, I, I'm, I'm glad I took the path I did. I don't think I was ever destined to be a great musician. I think, um, I think I can hold the sticks well, and I think that I know enough to get by. Um, but my, where life was leading me was somewhere different, and it wasn't in music, even though I thought it was. Yeah, and that's why, that's why I am where I am now. And, and, but shit, I mean, like. You know, I still have a, uh, you know, I, I moved into this new studio about two years ago. I built myself a proper, small and very moderate, but proper recording studio here. Yep. And I'm still making music. I'm still, uh, you know, recording people and recording new people. And so for me, that's kind of like, kind of where I want to be. Like, I like, I still get to do the, you know, the music side of things. I get to walk downstairs and record and play and, and, you know, I still play shows. I still play with bands right now which is crazy to think about and you know it's good enough for me i wish i wish i could play a little bit more but i don't wish it was my life and i don't wish that it had been my life either yeah i i almost think that it, it kind of worked on everyone's favor not everyone but a lot of people's favor that it, the our a lot of our bands didn't succeed because i think you know even talking to ian from newfound glory it's like that's still his life and he it's yeah. kind of like it came it, it's now just the yeah i show up and we do this and the drive in the beginning is is really exciting and fun but as you get older you're kind of like i kind of just want to stay in my town and stay in my house and go to my local bar or go to my local places and just stay here there's and, definitely an effort in getting older yeah for sure yeah um i that's that's something that, that Chris Barker and I fight about when we get together is cause we don't get together often anymore. And, and as he said in this interview, like that's not his life anymore. He's got, you know, he wants to be at home with his, with his family and, and you know, he doesn't miss it. And we joke cause I, I, for those that don't know, I ended up playing drums in, in day at the fair and ended up playing on the last record. And, you know, 
Chris and I kind of did those songs together and, and, um, and we still play once a year, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, it just, it, it, it would end up becoming was like, uh, hold on. Just that, I totally just lost my train of thought. I literally lost my train of thought. Go, talking about how 10 years ago, wanting to be in a band and then not playing shows and not want to play shows, the comfort of being home. Being old. That's what it was. What was it? Uh, you got, you cut out there. Uh, sorry. I said like when you're, uh, when you get older, you're comfortable just staying at home and doing whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, so everybody knows now that I just said it, that right. So day at the fair, those guys, they all joke with me because they all have like, they get up and go to work in the morning and they put their kids on the bus, except for Todd. And, uh, you know, they come home and they like, Todd goes to work in a lab. Right? From what I gather, he puts on a lab coat and he like makes diseases in a bottle and stuff. And, and Chris Barker like bosses people around and I'm not sure what the fuck Rob does, but I know that he like puts on khakis and goes to a desk. And, Rob like, does websites for the thing that's seen on TV. <laughs> yeah. But I don't like, I either roll out of bed at 5 a.m. or I roll out of bed at 10 a.m. or, you know, depending on what my day dictates. And I, I live in this big, old, weird building with, you know, and I take pictures for a living of like advertisements and stuff. And so they always joke me. They're like, you're you're kind of like permanently on tour. Like and if a group message ever starts between all of us at 7 a.m., somebody by 7.05 has commented, you know, well, it'll take three hours for Dave to get back to us because he's not awake yet. And <laughs> And I always just wait and I respond at noon and I always write, sorry, just woke up. What's happening? Because like, <laughs> you know, it's more fun that way. But, but that's kind of like, that's, that's what it became. You know, like they, they, they kind of look at me like, wow, you're still playing music. Like you're still playing shows. You're still writing new songs. You know, like working with Chris and getting him, like Chris has like mountains of new songs that he's written yeah. that the world will never hear because he's too content with his life to, try to get them out into the world yeah but you know what it is though it's i i there's a re, there's a recording studio block from my apartment and i was just there before we got in the interview and i, and I was talking to them and i go yeah and they're like what's it they're like oh it's 50 bucks an hour i'm like oh man i should i should really come down here i'm like i got a bunch of songs i go but i just don't want to spend the fucking time it just mm -hmm. it's so involved to just yeah even just to get your equipment there is one thing and then to mic shit and then to test it and then to like do the drums and then to do the bass like as a kid, I thought that was so exciting. I thought that was so interesting and so intriguing. Like, wow, we get to fucking do this. This is, I mean, this is like, I saw the future in it. And now yeah. when I think about it, which Chris might too, it's just, it's, it, it's like, it's not an hour. It's like five hours. And so when you think it about is. that, he's thinking about all the shit he's going to miss in those five hours. And I right. think that's and, why and, he doesn't want to do it. Maybe I feel bad talking about him like, like this, but, um, I don't, but, <laughs> but, but regardless of why he doesn't want to do more with the songs that he writes and this goes for anybody i'm not, I'm not going to say chris anymore but like you know for anybody who writes songs that that sits on them like hey maybe that's good enough for you like maybe that's maybe that's what you want to do you want to go downstairs drink a couple glasses of pinot and you know rip off a couple tunes and then like go to bed like good for you Thank God you can still do that. Yeah. You know, like, um, you want to go and like put the time in and record and like pay somebody money. Like, man, that's fucking awesome too. Like, you know, the guy I'm playing with now, Chris Schultz, who used to be in the suicide pact. Yep. Um, you know, like I met Chris at, at a fucking day at the fair show, like day at the fair reunion show in Philly. And we, he sent me a bunch of songs like six months later. And he was like, Hey, I just wrote these acoustic songs. And I was like, I was so blown away that he was writing stuff and putting it online. Like he was like, Hey everybody listen to the song I just wrote yeah. in my bathroom basically. And I was like, Oh, he also has a fucking recording studio. studio and he's amazing at recording. No, no, no. Chris had nothing. He was literally in his bathroom with a, a blue Yeti mic and his laptop. Seriously? Yeah. And I called him and I said, Chris, you need to come to my studio and let me record you. And so he came up and we spent like, we spent a proper like Friday from 7 PM through Sunday at like noon recording almost nonstop we slept for like four hours oh, oh, oh i'm mixing him up with um you're thinking of charlie I'm, no i'm thinking of charlie. uh who, who recorded the epilogue oh rob freeman rob freeman that's what i'm thinking of rob's got a giant studio okay yeah chris rob doesn't is, yeah. chris does not have a studio all right go on no. yes rob freeman's a whole nother story <laughs> but yeah chris you know i was just like hey man like 
wow, you're, you're doing stuff. You're making music. Let's, let's make music together. And so we started making music together. That's what happened. Like I was just, I was enamored that he was making music and cause nobody else in my life was doing that. And so I was like, let's do that together. You know? And he was like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and then there's the guys like Rob Freeman who own a fucking recording studio and you know, that's his living. That's what he does. He makes many, many records. So, um, I don't know. Yeah, no, I totally, I, I get it. I, uh, I, I wish there was this, this piece of me that had that fire. Like I did when I was 18. Cause I just saw the, like I said, the future and everything we were doing and in showing up and playing in front of five kids. I was like, yeah, but that five kids is going to turn into 15 and then 30 and then a hundred, you know, just because they're going to bring the right people back. And I saw like recording was this. And now it's also, I think it's a piece of doing something and having it not work out the way that you want to know. I wouldn't consider it a failure. I think failure is just in the eyes of, you know, the beholder or whatever. Sure. Um, I think that there's a burnout of the way I perceive things where I, I have a bunch of bunch of songs that I would love to go record, but um I'm also very afraid of sitting in my apartment and recording to a microphone because I don't want to. I don't want people hearing me. It sounds as weird yeah, as that sounds. No neighbors. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. You got to mess I, up on your own. Yeah. Well, I don't. I'd like. I just. I don't want anybody hearing me. Even um, if someone asked me to play them a song, just me and them, I'm like, I, I can't. I have yeah. this weird fear of. I can get up in front of a room of 300 people and do it easily. But for some reason, I'm just like, uh, I think it's because if, if I go into an, a, a restaurant or a bar and they're like, oh, there's a open mic night or, oh, there's a band playing. I'm like, I didn't show up here for this shit. Like I showed up here for something different. And I think when you play music in front of people that they don't want to hear it, I, I'm like, well, they didn't ask for this. So I think that's like right. my fear of the net. Um, yeah. <laughs> See, I played, I, I did in my, so at some point in those 10 years that I didn't play, when I started to play again, I actually ended up playing in cover bands. I played in like two cover bands. And one of them I just played uh, like congas in. I literally played like percussion. Uh, yep. Me, me and Steve. And, and it was the blast because we never rehearsed. And we just played, you know, like the hits, the cover tunes that everybody knows yep. in bars. And I, I just, I had a blast doing it. It was a good entryway back in. And then I ended up playing with a band and we did like, like cool tunes, uh, you know, like nineties kind of grunge rock and stuff. And, and even that I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. Like it was interesting to play to a crowded bar where nobody gave a shit that you were doing anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like literally like nobody, it was different because the last time I played, everybody would stand there and stare at you. Yeah. This time it's right? like, you're done and no one claps. You're like, okay, next song. Okay. Yeah. Like maybe the guy in the corner who had been there since 2 PM would be like, yeah. But other than that, <laughs> And I found solace in that. I found like, oh, this is kind of fun. You can do whatever the fuck you want and not worry about it. And, but then I also got to the point where I was like, I always promised myself I wouldn't be 35 years old playing in a cover band. And here I am at 34 playing in a cover band. So you better stop pretty soon, David. <laughs> <laughs> I don't and know. I did. I did. I did. I, I stopped because I just didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like, you know. Well, that was like also that. different too. Like you, there was like different too, like where, didn't the guy have like the, the fucking the, the notes of the songs in front of them the whole time was that that band in oh, morristown i played with all sorts of people i mean i played with guys who literally read off the paper i played with guys with ipads i played with guys who just fucking remember everything you know i will say though when i when i got back from traveling i think it was when i in 2015 i came back and i went to your studio which was in that giant warehouse, space. warehouse yeah, in Parsippany. Parsippany. yeah i had fun i had a blast where you and me took an acoustic song I made into a full like oh yeah song. actually like, that was in Marstown no we did that in Marstown no no those are the acoustic songs that I did oh no you're right sorry yeah. yes we did that that, that was that was uh that was before we, uh, those songs we did before we redid yes. that acoustic song yeah correct, correct. You're but, so wrong. I'm so wrong I know you are you are <laughs> you're a little whore um <laughs> see it's endearing when you say it see yeah everyone listening you just call people a little whore and you, they know that they that they love you um all right man well i am going to wrap this up uh do it oh, a couple it questions up, i've gotten so off off key oh that's i don't fucking care <laughs> i mean so what do you like when i started the podcast it seemed like there was this huge burst of people wanting to be nostalgic about the scene like why do you think there was such a Gra- like people gravitated towards wanting to talk about this. I think because nobody 
I think because it had been out of everybody's life for so long, you know, and we all remember it and we all think about it as being a really great time, you know, and I'm, but, I'm so confused by that though. Like I'm not to cut you off, but like even just what you just said about how, you know, Chris and them are like, Dave, like you're still playing in a band of music. Like I think that you and I, even though we did the scene ended and we separated ourselves, I think you and I still lived as if, cause I think being, working for yourself i think there is something about keeping you connected to that and i don't think we i I always remember talking about the back then so it's so weird to me that people haven't had that conversation but from about 20 years ago yeah i mean there's a lot of people that just kind of they stayed on longer than i did right yeah when they left they left and that was it Hmm. you know because they 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 stayed on through their twenties and then they were like, Oh, I found a wife or whatever. I'm starting a family and people with families don't do that. And I think, I think they just, they really got away from it. You know, like, and I, I got away from it in my twenties. I walked away from it and kind of came back to it. And there's actually, sorry, totally on topic, but off topic. There's actually a movie called like the F word. I think. Have you seen this? Uh, I've, I think I've heard of it. I think it's called the F word or the other F word. It's, it's all oh, the, about the dads. Yeah. The dads. Yeah. It's all about like Pennywise. the guys and like it's fat Mike and. Oh, it's Captain fantastic. Pennywise. It's a great. It's fantastic. Yeah. Cause it's, you can still do it. Like you can play music and make a living doing weird shit. You know, like not, not going to work every day at, at, at you know, whatever me and Marcus, like you can go and do stuff and still have a family and a life and, no, it's not as easy. It's a much harder balance, actually, you know, when you don't have a nine to five and you have to like figure out how to balance like, oh, I need to get home to see my kid or I need to get home to see my wife. And, but I've got to be on tour for four months. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. That's work, though. And so I, I found the movie to be great to watch because I was like, yeah, wow, these these guys lasted in the industry because they figured out how to do that. Yeah. And because they write awesome songs. But, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. but they learned how to live with it, you know? Yeah, but at the same time, though, you saw how the the singer Pennywise he quit. He made that documentary because he wanted to talk about his love of being a dad, and he quits Pennywise in that documentary, even though now he's back in the band. But exactly. he uh, I think everybody he was like, needs a break. You just gotta balance it out. Yeah, he was like, dude, I'm fucking over this. Like, I can't sing Broham Broham at like 48. He's like, do I right. still feel the same way? Like, except you can. <laughs> it's, yeah, no, that's true. I guess I guess you can. I, I'm, I, I'm just so confused though that people literally had such a hard stop because when they're talking, they're like, "Man, I haven't thought about that in years." I'm like, "Man, I never stopped thinking about it." That's the yeah. crazy thing. Like I've, I, I think also is that my, the people I'm friends with now, the majority of my really good friends, are all the people that I met back then. So when it's like when you see them and you know see you guys, we, you, remember of when you met, right? So yeah. it's like it's like this open straight line to being 18 talking to someone you've known since you were 18 totally i think a lot of people they might have broke from the scene and just didn't talk to anybody and then like the facebook group shows up and they could like someone throws a patch up and all of a sudden this memory gets triggered and they're like holy shit and i don't think it's just it's not the patch they're remembering it's where they were when they saw that or what they felt like when they heard that music for the first time and i think Dude, that's what transports them it's yeah. the smell of the room it's the stale cigarettes it's it's everything that surrounded what was happening at that point and i think that seeing a pat i mean it, it does it for me too you know like i it's funny i've you know i just moved whatever a year and a half ago and, and there was boxes that i've been sitting in closets and like dude there was like a patch printed on the back of like quarter row pants and i was like i remember the day i got this <laughs> i remember who handed it to me yeah. like you know and i don't remember shit from back then but like i remembered all of it and i was like yep it just you know it was just like a moment in time that you kind of have and you'll always have and i think that it falls away when you start to get older like always and um you know i think that you uh calling people and annoying them with your questions <laughs> made that you know all come back for a lot of people and and that's what's fun about it is that you know like you get to remember like because honestly there's guys who i can see their faces but i don't know who the fuck they are i don't know their names or and they were you know important people and yeah. you know, popular people and but I don't know. I yeah. think um, that, that that's what makes it so cool. Well, I think like I kind of get to geek out on it because I get to talk to people now on this level where back then I was like, we're miles apart from each other. And now I'm talking to them and asking them questions going, 
holy shit, like 17, 19 year old me would be flipping the fuck out right now. These are the questions I want to ask them back then. Yeah. And it's just like so cool. So, but then I get to talk to them on this like normal level where sometimes I'm just like, can I ask you these questions? Am I allowed? It's like you and I can just sit here and spitball and it doesn't matter. You know, it's like, I'm not, I'm not worried that I'm going to piss you off and have you be like, you're not allowed to ask me that. Right, right. But, uh, all right. Two more questions. Go for it. What would you like to plug before I let you go? You're not allowed to ask me. All right. Next question. I had to say that because you just said it. Um, what so do I funny, Dave. <laughs> it's good. It's all I got. Actually, no, I want to ask you a question. Why don't you go to the Lane Meyer show? The Rainmeyer uh, show. I had a show myself that night. You did? Oh, actually, sorry. I, the night before that, I played in Asbury Park at the Saint. And um, I'll plug this. Ready? Uh, I played, uh, I opened for a record release party for a guy named Sean Tobin. And anybody who doesn't know who that is should go Google Sean Tobin right now because he makes awesome, acoustic y, punk rock y, folk y, like, he's like Frank Turner but American. Oh. Sean Tobin. Go check him out. I'm actually going to start recording with him in two weeks. He's coming here to record with me. Um, so anyway, I went and played a show, uh, on Friday night in Asbury opening for him. And then Saturday, my family was all in, uh, uh, Stone Harbor, New Jersey. And so I had to be there. And so I couldn't be at the Lane Meyer show. And I was sad because mm. that would have been a shit ton of fun to see mm. all those people and do all that thing. <laughs> yeah. That sucks, man. I it remember does I, suck. It I, did I, suck. I think I asked Chris that week. I said, is, is Dave coming? And, and so Chris goes, no, he goes, He's he's like he's being weird about it. No, I was actually somewhere else in the world. So because Chris actually called me and said, "This is funny." I I you know when the whole thing came up, I was like, I texted Chris and I was like, "Wow, you finally agreed to do this." And Chris was like, "Yeah, I don't want to talk about it." Blah, blah, blah. You know, he's playing it cool, and and then within like within like maybe like twenty minutes, he was like, "You should play guitar." <laughs> oh, that was the thing too, because yeah. I yeah, because. So he invited me to play like a song or two with you guys. And I was like, that dude, I was like, whatever you want, like whatever you want or don't want, just let me know. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to ask, I'm not going to force myself into it. And like, obviously I'll just come and hang out. And so I was like, this is great. You know, and, but if you want me to play a song with you, that'd be cool too. And so he was like, yeah, I want you to play these two songs. And I was like, great. Just run it by the rest of the band first because you know, <laughs> <laughs> typical Chris, typical Chris, right. classic like, Chris. <laughs> yeah. And the joke was he, the joke ended up becoming was that I was just going to play all of the songs on guitar and he was just going to sing. <laughs> that was, that's where the joke ended up going. But he was like, yeah, yeah, no, uh, I talked with them and everybody's in on it. Like you should come. Yeah. That never guitar. happens. Never happens. No, of course it didn't happen. Never happened. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then I ended up, you know, I was out of town. So, all right. All right. Although it would have been amazing to just show up and have you be like, oh, wait, you're playing a song tonight? <laughs> well, that's what, I mean, um, uh, Steve from LWL, he had uh, Heath get up on stage yeah. from Midtown play. He uh, had Dave get up and do uh, the Taxi Cab song. Awesome. He also wanted Brett from um, Joystick. To, he was supposed to come down and do, they were going to do Tugboat, I think. Uh, but oh. he just couldn't make it from Brooklyn or, or I'm sorry, like New York. I, forget, I think he's in Brooklyn. Um yeah, so it was just, it was awesome because Steve did that. He actually, but he planned it with these guys where he had all these people come up and do that. It was so fucking cool, and, and so that like was was really perfect. So, but yeah, I don't think. Uh, I mean, it, it would have been awesome if you definitely got on stage. But I always think that like being a, a, a standalone singer though, like without a guitar, when you play with a guitar, it just always looks awkward. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think. Yeah. Stupid. Yeah. Don't do that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> all right then you gotta hold on to the mic and uh, yeah and just so. kind of like find a way to get like a rock star stance and it's just especially when the crowd's not into it and you're kind of like oh i have no one there's no like people i'm not like forcing my the mic in someone's mouth to sing along they're like 10 feet back from the stage this is just really uncomfortable <laughs> i hate that all right last, last question um what scene ethics do you still hold on to to this day um you know i think i think i just kind of the whole Blah. That was a stupid start to the answer. I think <laughs> I'm just gonna end it right there. <laughs> I know. I've got nothing to say. <laughs> right? Yeah. And done.
next week on this was the scene. Um, <laughs> no, I, just, I think the thing that I that I hold on to is that um, I've always tried really hard to just you know do what felt right, and if it meant that I played with this band or that I gave myself the Benjamin Franklin haircut or that, you know, I, whatever it was, I, I just, I, I wanted it to feel good for that time, that period of time. And I knew it wasn't forever. And I knew that it wasn't going to, you know, like become my life, but let's just, let's just go here. And I think that was for me, that's what the scene was. It was a bunch of people who were like, no, no, this is cool right now. Let's do this. And yeah, like eventually we're going to go start another band or, you know, the scene's going to change and people are going to start dressing differently and writing different types of music. And like, and then it'll be that. And so I like to think that I can still roll with the punches, uh, at 40 years old and I can, you know, I can change with the times and I can be like, Oh, we're doing this now. And in six months we might be doing something different and just keep your eyes open, you know, keep your head up and just keep thinking about where you're going to go and don't get stuck where you are. And that's what the scene was for me.